We are recording right now. I see it. All right. I'm going to try to remember to look up. So if, you're, if I'm breaking up, you guys flap your arms or something, please. Raise your and, hand. Um, yeah, raise your hand to make noise, okay. do whatever you can do. Okay, well, <laughs> while she's reading, what's up? Everybody mute. I'm going to mute too. Okay, this is um, from December 1905. Uh, the Ponca Sundance. It says... Uh, Field Columbian Museum is where it's from, anthropological series. So it's really, really, you saw that picture, it's really old. Um, let's get into it. Oh, the author is George A. Dorsey. Oh, wait a minute, guys. Shoot, that's the wrong one. Is yours working? Mine is not even coming up. That is what ridiculous. is this? Ah, my pictures aren't, my, my pages aren't coming up. They're coming up blank. What about on your other phone? And I don't know if it's my internet. Yeah, that's a good idea. Oh, I got the pictures. But I don't, don't have anything pictures, else. Just the reading. No. We're going to have, we got a little difficulty. Okay, Today, I have uh, class, we're, uh, we're going to be I talking about uh, mm -hmm. Sundance. We're going to have our second annual Sundance here in Wadi Oklahoma. I'm going to mute because this is going to read. Yeah, I finally found it. I had one with the, the images and one with the words. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, this, oh, there's a lot. <laughs> okay, introductory note. I'm going to read this real fast. Um, the account of the Ponca Sundance here presented may at best be considered imperfect and unsatisfactory. Eagle can explain that. Um, this is and this is due chiefly to the fact that I have been able to witness the ceremony but once, and this is the author um, Dorsey, and that opportunity has not been afforded to investigate the ceremony by questioning the priests. It must also be noted that owing to the rapid deterioration of the Ponca in recent times, uh, remember the timing of this book, um, the ceremony has lost much of its former hold on the tribe. Owing to the proximity of the camp circle to the railroad, uh, I looked up. <laughs> okay, owing to the proximity of the camp circle to the railroad and to white communities of considerable size, the ceremony is witnessed each year by a large number of white visitors. This has contributed much to weaken the genuineness of the feeling of the ceremony. Not the least difficulty to which I encountered the brief time that I have been able to devote to the Ponca was my inability to secure the services of a satisfactory interpreter. This does not mean that there are no educated young men in the tribe or that the priests are unwilling to give such information as they possess about the ceremony. The real difficulty lay in securing an interpreter who would be willing to confine his attention to the subject in hand. Imperfect as this account is, however, I offer it as a contribution to the study of the Sundance in general. It is with, with much pleasure that I acknowledge <clears throat> my indebtedness to White Eagle, the chief of the Ponca, to the minor chiefs and to the priests and dancers of the ceremony for their uniform willingness to assist me both in securing information on the ceremony and in photographing the more important events and that's signed by George A. Dorsey, November 1st, 1905. I'm trying to turn this, this better. Okay, um, part one, his general observations. Um, the name of the ceremony, the name the Pancas give to the sun dance ceremony is sun seeing dance, like seeing with your eyes, sun seeing dance. That is the sun is a witness to the dance. Another name at times applied to the ceremony is sacred or mystery dance. The time of the ceremony is determined by the thunder men or the Sundance priests who assemble at the call of the tribal chief in the spring for this purpose. The month being determined, they choose the time of the month when the moon is at least half full. All of the Ponca ceremonies of which I have any record have been held in June or July, the majority in the latter month. The participants, the priests of the ceremony are called thunder men, 
and our medicine men who have fasted at least four times during previous ceremonies and who have learned the rites and paints, like um, paint, like you paint a wall, paint your face. The priests determine who shall dance in each ceremony, each priest selecting one or more men who shall report to the priests in general at a certain time during the ceremony. When the dancer selects his instructor and remains in his care until the end of the ceremony and compensates him liberally for his instructions, his run on sentence, I apologize. Um, each individual chosen may be expected to be thus called on three additional performances, whereupon he becomes a Sundance priest. To be thus chosen is not without considerable honor, for each dance is supposed to bear the sufferings of the tribe. The priesthood of the Ponca Sundance is therefore a close corporation with self-perpetuating power. Each priest selects a servant and two pipe bearers, one to take care of his pipe and the other to look after the gifts or the presents. The ceremony is in charge of the oldest and the most learned of the priests and more especially under the direction of the war priest of the tribe. There are neither pledgers for the ceremony itself, nor those who vow they will dance and fast. During the ceremony, the directors were as follows. Okay, it says White Eagle Chief. The next guy was Harry Bear. He's the leader. Big Elk Assistant Leader. Okay, am I still here? Okay. The following list contains the names of the priests or grandfathers as those who attend to the painting are called and those who were to dance and fast. The priest is no ear. Um, beside him, it says dancers through hole and excuse me, black buffalo bull. Another priest, number two, is Little Walker. The dancers beside him are Frank Eagle, Fire Shaker, Yellow Ricket, and Car Carl Forbear. The next priest down is two crows. The dancers are Philip Other, Charles McDonald, Martin Blueback, Jack Roughface, and Edward Little Warrior. The next priest down is Sits on Hill. The dancers Little Hale, Willie Poor Horse, Albert Black Cole. Little Dancer is the next priest. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, the priest next is Little Dancer, and then the dancers are James Other, Jesse Gives Water. Jack No Care, Black Horse, uh, Polecat, oh wait, excuse me, yeah, Jack No Care was the end, Polecat is the next priest, and his dancers are Black Horse, who was Osage, um, Clarence, Back Hair Horse, and Joe Knows the Country, Let's see how much, we only have a couple of more of these, just so y'all know, um, Black Elk is the next priest down, his dancers beside him are Fred Smith, Fred Crooked Hand, and they say Oto. It's spelled wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's what they mean. That he's Oto. Um, White Deer is the next priest. The dancer there is his dancers are uh, Makes Cloud, Little Snake, Oscar Makes Cry, John Bull, Buffalo Chief, and Mrs. Little Snake. Little Hard Man is the next priest. Uh, his dancers Atkins White Tail, Leonard Big Goose. Leon Little Turtle, and John Hudson, and they mention he's Oto. From the list, it's seen that four Oto and one Osage participated in the ceremony and one woman. Everybody good? Can y'all hear? Okay. Uh, the time and place, yeah, we're, we're good. Okay, hold on, let me grab a drink. Um, the time and place of the ceremony have having previously been announced to the tribe, they aim to move camp and have formed the camp circle by evening of the day. Oh, excuse me. They formed the camp circle by evening of the day before that set for the beginning of the ceremony. From this time until the close of the ceremony, all who are to participate in the ceremony abstain from women, otherwise serious accidents would result. On the first day, the four secret teepees of preparation, the camp circle being completed, the priests select four teepees, located one on the southeast, one on the southwest, one on the northwest, and one on the northeast of the circle. They assembled within these teepees according to the following grouping. Okay, number one, we had white deer, black elk, and polecat. Number two, little dancer, sits on hill, and hairy bear. Teepee number three, we had two crows, no ear, and little walker. 
And number four, White Eagle, Big Elk, and Little Hard Man. <clears throat> no rites were performed, but they visited back and forth from one teepee to another, provided certain raw materials to be used later in the ceremony, decided on the individuals who were to perform certain rites later on, and discussed the names of the men who were to be invited to participate as dancers during the ceremony. It says morning feast. Um, it's spelled as, a, as if you're mourning someone like a funeral, morning feast. At about noon, there occurred on the south side of the circle a morning feast, at which time many presents, including horses, ponies, trunks, shawls, etc., were given away. This was followed by the feast, and there are some images we'll have to... Um, okay, we have... Here we go. The most important event of the day was the appointing by each priest of pipe bearers and a servant who should run errands and assist him generally. The servants collectively act as police and guard the camp. The pipe bearers always accompany the priest. One bears his pipe and paints and fasts just as the priest does who, is, who appoints him. The other pipe bearer looks after the presence and the priest receives for instructing the dancers. And for day two, with daybreak, on day two, the servants begin clearing, began clearing and making ready the space within the camp circle. And the principal participants and mounted dog soldiers began to appear. Then the preparation for the sham battle. At about seven o'clock, the chief White Eagle made the following announcement. Quote, the enemies are coming to attack our camp. We must be on the alert. All you young men get ready for we must drive them away and let them know that we are prepared to repulse any depredation at all times. Mount your ponies, shoulder your guns, prepare to follow your leader, who would be Harry Bear, and repulse them. They must be driven away for the safety of our camp and of our women and children, end quote. Immediately following this announcement, young men in old gaily attired began to appear and parade around the inside of the camp circle. Big Elk, from time to time, urged them to hurry and call for more men to volunteer. Near the center of the big circle, are we good? Near the center of the big circle, Big Elk took his position with a standard, and by him sat several musicians about a large drum. Near the drummers were gathered the men who had been selected to fast and dance in the ceremony. White Eagle stood to their left and directed the performance, which was in the nature of preparation to meet the enemy. Thus arranged, they sat war they sang war songs, related war stories for about an hour. And okay, spying the center pole. In the meantime, the mounted warriors, the so-called dog soldiers, led by Little Soldier, set off to the north and went to the timber to go through the formality of buying the tall willow tree which is chosen because the willow is so hard to kill which had been selected the night before by the chiefs then they returned toward the camp circle having painted themselves and being provided with grapevine shields and willow poles for lances the majority of the horses were painted and provided with willow collars and bell pendants. They entered the camp circle on the north side and singing, shouting, and yelling and brandishing their guns. They rapidly rose around the camp circle, passing via the east and the south. They then charged upon the equally bedecked and painted crowd in the center of the circle. And for over half an hour, there ensued a very spirited and hilarious sham battle. During the sham battle, sham battle white eagle and the sub chief selected certain men to capture the enemy that is to go with the one who located the tree to cut to the timber cut the tree and bring it to the center of the camp circle so the tree was the pretend enemy <laughs> it was then about midday and all went to their teepees for the noon feast and to give away presents to show their joy at the successful outcome of the sham battle uh, mention has been made of the teepees selected by the priests on the previous day, which served as meeting places. In the early morning, each of these was taken up bodily by women, relatives of the priests, and carried within the camp circle about 100 feet towards the center. These teepees then became, oh, sorry, these teepees then became sacred and secret and could not be entered by anyone except the priests who belonged to them or later by the dancers 
who elected to have a grandfather, a priest, who in conjunction with one or more priests own the teepees. Immediately after assembling in the secret teepees, the servants were given the names of those who were to be invited to fast. They at once made the sound of the camp crying out the names. The men on hearing their names, excuse me, called went, oh, the men on hearing their names called went to any one of the four secret teepees they chose and each selected his grandfather, the one he preferred to be his instructor. Each grandfather, however, aimed to get at least four men to paint and direct. Having chosen a grandfather, they henceforth remained in his teepee, except when they were in the Sun Dance Lodge proper. Okay. In this secret teep excuse me, in this secret teepee, they were painted and costumed for the public performances. And from the time they entered the teepee until their, the ceremony came to an end, they fasted. Uh, building the lodge. At about two o'clock, a large body of men and women went to the timber and brought in many short limbs. With these, under the direction of White Eagle, the Sundance Lodge was erected. This differed entirely from the elaborate and substantial lodge erected by the Cheyenne and Arapaho. The limbs were sharpened at one end and thrust into the ground in the form of a circle about 75 feet in diameter, with a wide open space or doorway towards the east. In this condition, the lodge remained until the following morning. In the meantime, the men appointed by White Eagle in the forenoon, led by the one who had located the center pole, had gone to that part of the timber where the willow tree was standing. Arrived at the tree, they halted, and the leader, Little Soldier, related a war story, telling how he had killed an enemy. Then he rode around the tree, thus capturing it. The man selected to chop the tree walked around it four times, touching the tree once each time. Then each man present marched around it, counting coup on the enemy. After that, it was felled without further ceremony and carried by men to the edge of the camp circle, where it was placed as to extend north and south or crosswise to the sun. And there it was left until the following morning. It should have been taken into the circle in the afternoon, but the men were too late in returning with it. As late as seven o'clock, White Eagle and Harry Bear rode around the camp pleading that the pole be brought in, although they knew that their plea would be in vain. Furthermore, the lodge should have been dedicated on this night, but as that was impossible, the men invited to fast dance and sang informally both within and without the enclosure, uh, without print, without proper um, whatever you call it. Uh, it looks like they were invited to fast and then danced and sang informally. Um, the Senate structure is a little weird. Uh, the four TP altars. Th these altars or dry sand paintings were erected in the afternoon, but the accompanying rites were not observed. Whether each altar was the work of one priest or of all in the TP, this was not ascertained. Okay, whether it was the work of one priest or all of them in the TP, this was, was not ascertained, nor was it known to what extent, if any, the dancers were allowed to participate in any rites which may have accomp accompanied the construction of the altars. Altar number one, a circular area within the TP had been cleared and the ground made smooth. The diameter of this cleared space was about five feet. The space surrounding the cleared area was covered with sage, the butts being directed towards the outer edge of the teepee. The symbol itself consisted of four concentric circles, the one on the inside being red, the second yellow, the third green. These circles were made by excavating the earth to a slight depth and covering the excavated surface with dried paint. The three inner circles were distant from each other about six inches. The outer circle was not excavated, but was produced by covering a broad irregular area outside the third circle with red paint, which extended as far as the sage. Altar number two. As in the first TP, the central part of the space within the TP had been thoroughly cleaned and the remaining portion covered with sage. In the center of this cleared area was a cross with arms of equal length produced by two lines of sand made at right angles. At the end of each line was a peculiar, uh, peculiar, I can't say that word. At the end of each line was a peculiarly shaped symbol, 
representing in a somewhat realistic manner the buffalo hoof. The explanation given of this altar was that the sage represented the people, the arms of the cross, the pass of the buffalo, and of the four winds, the buffalo hoofs, and of course being symbolic buffalo. Altar number three. The clear space and the sage occupy the same relative areas they did in the first and second teepees. In the cleared area was a comparatively level and sand field about in diameter. Surrounding this was a shallow trench two inches in width with its sides covered with red paint. Over the sand field, the narrow trench and the area of clear ground still remaining were scattered eagle downy feathers. According to my informant, there should have been four colors in this altar, but the leaders had changed it to suit themselves in order to make the medicine stronger. The red trench was the symbol of the sun, while the whole altar represented the nest of the thunderbird. Altar number four. I can't get my glasses right. The altar in this teepee bore a general resemblance to that in altar number one. The center of the cleared area being occupied by four concentric circles the inner by four concentric circles with equal space between them. The inner circle, two feet and a half in diameter, was blue. The second circle was red, the next blue, and the outer circle red. No explanation was obtained concerning the meaning of this altar beyond the statement that it was the sun symbol of one of the four medicine worlds. Okay, third day. At the sunrise, White Eagle made the circuit of the camp circle on horseback calling for the dancers to repair to their respective teepees of preparation. The race to the center pole. Within half an hour, the, the dancers in charge of their grandfathers left the four teepees and assembled on the south side of the camp. There they formed in one long line facing north. The dancers were entirely naked except for a loincloth and blanket. Their blankets were given to the servants of their grandfathers. And as they received them, they shouted four times. At the signal, all raced to the opposite side of the circle where the winner of the race, Crazy Buffalo, stepped upon the foot of the center pole, thus having the honor of first counting coup on a dead enemy. The other racers repeated this performance. One struck it with a stick and all sang a victory song in honor of the winner of the race. Then by means of short poles, which had already been provided for the purpose, they lifted the tree and carried it to the Sundance Lodge, halting four times on the way. The dancer, dancers and their grandfathers returned to the secret teepees to begin preparation for the ceremony proper. The dog soldiers went to the timber for additional burrows to complete the arbor forming the lodge. When these were in place, women fastened four canvas teepees to the sides of the arbor and attached the free ends to the lodge poles thus forming a better protection for the dancers from the burning rays of the sun. Painting the center pole. The chiefs, leaders, and priests gathered around the center pole. Standing Elk related some war stories, each story stating that on the return of each party, they were successful and wore the black paint of victory. Then White Eagle related seven war tales, each one with an equally happy ending. Next, Red Leaf related a tale in which the victors returned home wounded and covered with blood. At the end of this tale, a band of red a foot and a half wide was, okay, a band of red a foot and a half wide, there we go, was painted near the center of the pole by Little Walker, who also painted the skull in his secret teepee. Then Yellow Bear related the story of a victorious party who, upon returning home, found that they had no black paint and so had to burn grass for use in blackening their faces. Little Walker then burned some dry grass and with the black ash thus formed, he painted a black band just above the red one. A large bundle of willows was placed in the fork of the pole tied by a long lariat rope, which hung free and a black handkerchief was tied to one of the forks as a mourning symbol. And that's M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Without further rights, the pole was raised into position. Just a moment. Everybody can still hear? Yep. Cool. Sorry about my voice. It's still not right. Um, preparation for the altar. 
After the pole was erected, the women cleared with hose a circular space about 10 feet in diameter west of and between the center pole and the outer edge of the lodge. The dirt they piled just at the foot of the center pole on the west side. About the outer or western quarter of the rim of the cleared space, they placed a layer of weed sage. In the meantime, before the teepee of each man selected to dance during the ceremony, a long trimmed pole had been erected by his mother or a female relative from the top of which streamed a long piece of calico or cloth. These were offerings or sacrifices and indicated that the teepees over which they waved, okay, the teepees over which they waved were contributing to the ceremony. Should a man erect one of the banners, he would be classed as a woman. The dancers enter the lodge. When the lodge was ready, a crier went forth to inform the priests who, during the time of the performance of the above mentioned rites, had been in the secret teepees preparing and painting the dancers. The priests and their subjects came forth from the teepees and started towards the lodge. On the way, they halted four times, sitting down on the ground for a few minutes each time. Arriving at the entrance of the lodge, they passed on around the outside, encircled it by the way of the south and west, halting four times again. Arriving at the entrance of the lodge, they turned and entered by groups, and each led by a priest or grandfather in the following order. Number one, no ear. Number two, little walker. Number three, two crows. Number four, sits on hill. Number five, little hard man. The dancers of each group were all painted and costumed alike, each bearing the paint and costume of his grandfather. The grandfather not only paints himself, but dances and fasts, as do the regular subjects. As the names of the dancers proper have already been given in connection with their so-called grandfathers in the list of participants, it's not necessary to repeat them. In describing the paints, the number of groups will refer to the numbers as arranged above. Completion of the altar. As the line of dancers entered the lodge, no ear and little walker, turned toward the cleared space, and the latter placed the painted buffalo skull, which he had carried from his lodge upon the sage, so that at the outer edge of the cleared space, the skull faced towards the center pole. The no ear deposited on the ground a pipe, which he so placed that its stem leaned against the base of one of the horns. This completed the altar. The skull bore the following paint, which presumably had been done by a priest while in the lone teepee. On the forehead of the skull was a square, the interior and posterior lines of the square being continued down the sides of the skull. In front of these were two additional lines continuing entirely across the skull. On each side of the lines of the square were two other lines, which were continued backwards to the base of the skull. The anterior ends of these two lines being connected by two parallel lines. All of the lines were narrow and red narrow red lines and I'm gonna see if I can let y'all see this really quick. Can you guys see that? Yeah. To give you a better idea of what's um, excuse that I'm sorry. That skull that Mask she's on. showing you guys, my grandpa White Eagle is the one that made it. I never did know what the exact uh, purpose why he painted it that way. When my grandfather Sudaska he painted it that way. But I never know why, and that book never told why what she's reading out of. Yeah, it's neat, though. Yeah, a lot of times he's missing a few things because, I guess, the language barrier. But, um, okay, beginning of the dance. Immediately after the arrival of the dancers, several musicians entered the lodge, took places about a large drum inside the lodge and just south of the entrance. They at once began to shout in a high voice and beat irregularly on the drum. The dance of the pipe bearers who had seated themselves in a long semicircular line about the west half side of the lodge arose. The grandfathers began shaking the bells or what they had in their hands. The dancers began to and heave their chests in a form of prayer. All raised their right hand toward the center pole. When they placed the whistles in their mouths and facing the center pole, they began to whistle and dance in time to the singing and drumming, which had now become regular. Thus, they danced during four successive songs, which I keep an hour. 
Then the drummers arose and outside the lodge toward the east. The dancers followed and halting by the side of the long poles with the calico banners, they formed in one long line east and west and faced the sun and danced. All returned to the lodge where they continued to dance at intervals for the remainder of the day, dancing outside to the sun on two additional occasions. On one of these two occasions, they waved toward the sun for long periods, the wreaths or shields or whatever else they had in their hands. At two o'clock, the relatives of the dancers provided a feast for all the musicians and guests. During the day, there was much rejoicing and giving away of ponies, etc. The evening and night performance. After a long period of rest in the afternoon, the dancers just before sunset filed out of the lodge. Everybody okay? Okay, I thought I heard someone. <laughs> okay, after a long period of rest in the afternoon, the dancers, just before sunset, filed out of the lodge and passed around by way of the south to the west side teepee where they formed in one long line, facing the setting sun in the west. Behind them were grouped the musicians about the drum. In front of the line of dancers stood Harry Bear. In this position, they danced for over half an hour. From time to time, the grandfather stepped from the line in front of their subjects, exhorted him, them, waved their leaves and sunglasses, etc. The dancing was extremely spirited throughout this period, and the greatest religious enthusiasm was shown by the crowd of spectators who formed in long lines extending from the east to the west on each side of the end of the line. After the sun had completely disappeared, the grandfather's and dancers engaged in a long and earnest prayer. Then they sat down and faced the east for a short period. Thereupon they returned to the teepee and rested until about 11 o'clock that night. Then they all arose, passed out of the teepees and stood facing east and danced to the moon for nearly an hour. They returned to the teepee and rested until after midnight when they again left the teepee and danced facing the west to the moon. The two remaining hours of the night were passed in sleep. Everybody still good? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, fourth day. Shortly before sunrise, the dancers began to adjust their kilts and made ready for the sunrise performance. They passed out of the teepee, accompanied by the grandfathers and musicians, as on the preceding day. Excuse me. Um, they formed in one long line facing the east and danced until the sun appeared. Again, they prayed long and earnestly as on the preceding night. They re-entered the teepee and after a short period of inactivity, they received their second paint. By seven o'clock, they were again ready for the dance and rising, they stood and prayed for nearly a quarter of an hour. Then they danced facing the center pole while the grandfathers earnestly exhorted and encouraged them. Several times during the day, they left the teepee as on the preceding day and danced with their eyes fully turned towards the blazing sun. Many times during this dance, the grandfathers worked themselves and subjects into a frenzy of excitement, waving before the dancers their wreaths and shields or by means of small hand mirrors, reflecting the sun directly in their subjects' eyes, at other times running about the dancers, just gesticulating frantically or directing their attention to something in the sun which they themselves could see and wish that the dancers might see. Throughout the day's performance, there was much feasting about the camp and many ponies and other presents were given away during the dancing episodes. Many priests, especially, po oh, excuse me, many presents, especially ponies, were also given to a band of about 30 Pawnees who were visiting the Poncas on this occasion. During the day, there were also held many morning feasts and dances at different points in the, in the camp circle. And in the afternoon, the women had held a scalp dance. On the fifth day, the sunrise dance. At five in the morning, the dancers were still asleep, lying in a circle about the edge of the lodge, their heads turned toward the center pole. Shortly after, they began to awaken. And before sunrise, they had brushed their hair carefully and adjusted their costume. Led by the musicians who beat in a regular time upon the drum, they passed outside the lodge and faced towards the east and raising both hands towards the sun, prayed for 15 minutes. Then to the exhortations of the grandfathers or the jingling of bells, 
the waving of bandoliers, etc. They danced during four songs. After the dance, they returned to the lodge to receive the third paint. By eight o'clock, all were ready. They passed out of the lodge in groups and not in single file as before. Each group, led by its leader, went either to the right or to the left and encircled the lodge and in regular positions danced for a quarter of an hour. Thus, the forenoon was spent. The final dance, shortly after noon, all the dancers in line passed outside the lodge, went toward the south to the west of the lodge and faced the sun overhead. Here they danced for nearly an hour, the dance being of an extremely spirited nature. All then re-entered the lodge. The dancers removed the cotton bands from their wrists and ankles and the willow wreaths from their bodies and deposited them along with the bunches of sage they had held in their hands on the mound at the foot of the center pole. Those who had used black handkerchiefs and those who had carried the little images attached to them to the base of the center pole. During this performance, the dog soldiers formed in a semicircle facing the lodge outside and the priests formed in, the, in a circle just behind them. Sacred rites and the teepees of preparation. After the dancers had removed all of their paraphernalia, except their kilts and loincloths, they reassembled in groups and each, led by its grandfather, went to one or the other of the secret teepees of preparation. The group from teepee number four, that of White Eagle, was followed by the author. Arrived at the teepee, the leaders entered first and were followed by the dancers. They all sat down in a circle around the sides of the teepee. The pipe bearers entered while a group of dog soldiers sat outside. <clears throat> Female relatives of the dancers brought food to the teepee and it was passed inside. The sacrifice. White Eagle sat opposite the entrance of the teepee and having the sand pitcher between him and the opening, took a cup of water in his left hand and with the thumb of his right made a small hole at the edge of the sand pitcher. Into this he poured some water, covered the hole, took a bunch of sage, dipped it in the cup, and drew it across the mouth of the dancer who sat next to him. Then with his hand, he pressed the rest of the water from the sage upon the dancer's head. He again dipped it into the water and went through the same performance with the dancer next in line and so on until he had gone exactly around the circle. He then passed the same piece of sage over the sun symbol, drawing it back and forth irregularly. Then he passed it back and forth on the symbol and destroyed it. Next, a cup of water was handed to each one of the dancers, after which each drank his fill from the pail. Then White Eagle took from a bowl some corn and offered it to the sun symbol on the south side. Food, consisting chiefly of dog meat, was then distributed among the dancers. As each dancer received his portion, he broke off a bit, raised it aloft, muttered a prayer and dropped it on the center of the sun symbol. After the feast, White Eagle uttered a prayer. Torture. At this point, the, authors, the author left this TP and went to White Deer's TP called number, it says nith, I don't know what that word is, number one. So far as could be learned, the same rites had been performed here as in TP number four. On entering, the dancers were preparing themselves for the sacrifice. Seated in the center was the priest, and one after the other, the dancers took a place by him, each as he did, and this is so confusing without commas, seated in, seated in the center was the priest, and one after the other, the dancers took a place by him, each as he did, so turning his right shoulder to the priest. The latter thereupon took up an awl, which he thrust into, oh my goodness, excuse me. Oh, why is this doing this? Uh, the latter thereupon took up an awl, A-W-L, which he thrust in the skin over the shoulder bone. And lifting up the skin, he cut off with a knife a circular piece about a half an inch in diameter, which he placed in the outstretched hand of the dancer. Okay. Thereupon, the latter stood up, raised the piece of skin upward, offering it to the sun, then placed it on a small piece of cloth with tobacco seeds, which had been provided for that purpose. During this rite of sacrifice, much good feeling and jolly, jolly he's trying to say jolly, jolidity, jollity, and even hilarity 
prevailed in the teepee. After the priest had completed taking the sacrifice from the last dancer, each handed to the priest his little packet containing the tobacco and the piece of skin. These he took to the lodge and deposited them on the ground at the foot of the center pole. It was then about two o'clock in the afternoon and the ceremony was at an end. Paints and costumes. All dancers at all times wore their hair loose and were naked except for a loose white, co white skirt over which hung in front the loose end of a red or blue loincloth. None of them at any time wore moccasins. Besides the paint which the dancers of each group wore in common, the members of each group wore or carried distinctive objects of a special nature. When the contrary is not stated, it will be understood that all the dancers, including the grandfather, are the one who painted them, and his servant and pipe bearers were painted and costumed alike. Each dancer carried in one hand a bunch of sage, and all wore wrist and ankle bands of cotton, which are symbolic of clouds. Thus they make themselves plain to the thunderbird. Each dancer also wore on his breast the usual eagle wing bone sun dance whistle, which was suspended from a cord around his neck. The lower end of the whistle, that is the part he inserted in the mouth, was covered from with short, short sage stem. Excuse me. This is said to prevent the dancers from becoming thirsty. Their first paint. This is the paint worn on the third day of the first entry of the lodge. As before noted, all preparations of costumes, painting, etc., were done in the secret teepees. The first group all wore an eagle breath feather attached by a short string to the scalp lock and a necklace of long red horse hair so arranged as to extend well down on the breast and shoulders. The entire body was painted yellow. Blue dots extended down the arms and surrounded the face. The upper half of the face of the grandfather was painted black. Second group, all wore an eagle breath feather attached to the scalp lock and a wide collar of eagle feathers about the neck. <clears throat> The entire body was painted yellow except the face, which was red. All the dancers except the grandfather wore a row of large red circular dots on the left arm and a red zigzag line on the right arm. Third group. All wore the eagle breath feather in the scalp lock. The grandfather wore around his neck a wreath of sage so fashioned that the sage projected outward on four sides, thus giving it a rectangular appearance. The bodies of all were painted yellow. The faces were painted a bright red, surrounded by a row of white dots. <clears throat> on the right arms were zigzag lines, and on the left, rows of large circular dots, both in bright red. The fourth group all wore an eagle breath feather in the scalp lock and a collar of eagle tail feathers around the neck. Three of the dancers carried in their right hands a compactly made ring of willow. The fourth carried in his right hand a similar ring of sage to which were attached eight eagle breath feathers i think is it, uh, eagle breath feathers okay i couldn't read that um the entire bodies of all oh, were painted sister. yellow sister i think he's saying he's breast about, yeah you think he's saying breast feathers that's what he meant to say that's what i thought yeah okay. eagle breast right that's what i thought but it says breath and so i'm like eh. <laughs> but okay eagle breast feathers thank you the entire bodies of all were painted yellow, so were the so were the faces of all except one who had only a blue line across his face. The others bore a row of blue dots around their faces. Um, fifth group, um, all wore eagle breath feathers attached breast. See, it's right there in front of me. All wore eagle breast feathers attached to their scalp locks. The grandfather wore a necklace or collar of black eagle feathers and all the dancers wore a collar of crow feathers. Okay, the entire body of all in the group was painted yellow except the face, which was red, surrounded by very large white spots. A row of large white spots extended up and down each arm and a circular row was found on the breast. Sixth group, the grandfather and three dancers wore a bandolier of crow feathers. The last dancer wearing, thank you, excuse me. <laughs> The last dancer wearing a bandolier of hawk feathers. All the dancers carried in their right hands a large sage ring to which was attached eight eagle bre breast feathers. The grandfather in his right hand carried a black handkerchief to which was attached a bell. 
The bodies of all were painted yellow. The faces were surrounded by small white dots. On the breast, back, and arms were marks made by applying the fingers when the paint was wet. Or the eagle breast feather attached to the scalp lock and a black tipped eagle feather in their hair. All wore an otter skin band on the right wrist to which was attached a small red painted human image of rawhide and a bunch of crow feathers. The bodies of all were painted red. The face was also painted red except within a white line which surrounded the face. Over the red of the body were right lines, white lines from 10 to 3 inches long made by the fingers. In the eighth group, all wore a red painted human image of rawhide 7 inches long suspended from a cord at the wrist. The grandfather in his right hand carried a stage ring and in his left a black handkerchief to which was attached a bell. One of the dancers carried an eagle feather attached by a string, another a small hand, a small hand looking glass. One wore a crow feather bandolier and the remaining dancers wore a hawk feathered bandolier. The bodies of all were painted red. Around the faces and up and down the bodies were three rows of white dots, the ends of which met in the front of their necks. The top of their heads were besmeared with thick red paint. And the ninth group all carried medicine war shields and wore in their scalp locks an eagle breast feather attached to a long string. One wore a plain rawhide bandolier. Another wore a red stained horsehair necklace. Another wore a broad bead necklace and a red string bandolier. The grandfather and two dancers were painted red. On the left side of the face was a crescent shaped line in blue. The other three dancers were painted yellow, blue line passing across their nose from one cheek to the other. Okay, that was the first paint. I think I'm gonna have a drink. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah, remember, I've gone a long way already. Spot. Okay, Connie, remember your spot yeah. right there. Uh, Diane, okay. uh, or Rob, or Grandpa, do you guys got a comment? Or questions you want to talk about? That was a lot of information. You're talking to a muted phone, Raymond. Oh, we can't hear you. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, okay, whenever somebody, when somebody starts talking, we're going to mute. And if he's asking a specific question to anybody or about what a sister wrote, read, or he might, she might have to reread, or you got a question for me about what you what I heard, and we'll debate on it, and then we'll start again. Okay, first off, I'm talking to that sham battle. That word for that in Ponca is egodize. Egodize. Sham battle. I did that round the camp four times. Then that scalp lock is in Ponca, that scalp lock is called Osku. Osku. A S K U. Ah, school. And that blue got that one right. blue paint, that blue back or that uh, blue paint, that that right there comes from a medicine bundle. When you open it after you sing these four sacred songs, to before you open it, you open it and take that out. There'll be a round cylinder in there in that cylinder is a warhawk it's a little that what do they call that uh great don't you uh yeah that is a warhawk the back of it is blue and occasionally they take blue paint and they paint that back of that little hawk blue and then they put it in that cylinder and Put it back in the in the medicine bundle. So that blue back name comes from that blue back of that little warhawk that goes inside a medicine bundle. Those are things I wrote down. I caught during your talk that white dots. Those white dots. Those represent 
hail that falls, you know, hail. For some reason, they use that. I don't know why. Well, we don't know why. But that's what that uh, brown white dot. The round blue dots stand for war. They were in war for some reason. You know, uh, defending the camp mostly. And uh, that those are things I wrote down that I could remember. And when you're painting, when you put a applied paint, that's called guillon. You, you're being painted with those colors. Those colors have meaning. Yellow, it stands for water and life. That's why the east, I mean, yeah, the east is yellow. And that that represents water, which is the same as life. Because without water, you don't have no life. The west is red. The north is black. And the south is white. Those are the meanings of those different color paints. When they, when they painted themselves black, that usually meant they were going to war. Black equal death. <laughs> and uh, white is south because it's hot. And those colors mean something is what I'm getting at that that i know i've read about and i've heard talk of i read that before what you're reading so i know what them are and then we can go on you know about those bundles one bundle a sacred bundle if you and another guy got into an argument over who killed that buffalo well, the Wanashi would go over there and they'd look at those arrows. And if your arrow made the kill, then you got the choice parts of that meat. Usually the hump was for old people. The rest of it could be divvied up amongst the tribe. And there's other things, all that could take us a day or two to go through to explain you know and they sing these songs those songs pertain to that word oh i was going to tell you though about that on the hunt and you put your hand on that you put your finger actually you just put your finger on that bundle and you have to tell the truth or Wakanda will come, Wakanda Piyashi will come get you, give you bad dreams, tell you make it right. You got to fess up. I made a mistake. No. <laughs> but those are some of the things I know. I could go over some more from what you read, you know, because I know where that last Sundance was held, right south of that grain elevator in uh, Marlin between that road that goes on and around that curve go west and the other one goes east that little patch right there in 1905 that is where that sundance we just read about happened was right there that was the last area now they got farm implements planted out there i'd like to go out there with my metal detector <laughs> But they won't let me on the property. I done asked. <laughs> but that's all I got to say. Anybody else want to comment or what you know? What that's what I know about that. Yeah. That Sunday. Thank you. Oh, that was great. That was but there's a lot of information in there. You know, women did have a part. We need to make some notes. Mm -hmm. Women did have a part. Women did have a part in that Sundance, you know, but there's a time of the month they can't participate. They have to go sit kind of far away. 
Uh, women he's, ta- he's, talk- he's talking about when a woman's on her moon. Yeah. And some of our dancers now, that's what they're worried about because this year we changed our date and it's going to affect some of our women that might not be able to participate. That's not, they can't even stand under the arbor, but they can watch from a distance. Yeah, I got it. And it's, it's far back, too. <laughs> But that's so what, what Grandpa's talking about, it, a lot of that what he's saying is true, and we have to do our best on that because remember, even then, over a hundred some years ago, the originality of it had changed because of Christianity and our colonization started. And we danced here from the first year we came here. We they took us in um 1877, but we didn't. They said that we didn't reach uh, Whitey Go, Oklahoma. That all of us didn't reach until 1878. Uh, uh, now, whether well, that's true or not, I don't know because the majority of that time we, we spent on that trek coming down here, and we spent a lot of time in Baxter Spring mm-hmm. and also over there where them quapaws are at today. Yeah, we have a lot of burial yeah. over there in Mime, Oklahoma area and by Missouri and the Kansas border. Yeah. And, but and so most most of us didn't get all down here until 1890. Then a majority of the tribe was here in 1890. July 20th, 1890, they declared most of the Ponca are here. And we had a celebration, not a powwow. Ponca powwow is misnamed. It's supposed to be Ponca celebration because we celebrated. We were all here. Yeah, that's. But those are what I know that I read and I heard about. My grandpa, Joe Harryback. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, oh, what's his name? Hujinga. So his his flag was raised yesterday, flew yesterday, and they're gonna have a dance Monday. And his grandson is going to read what he did. He was he was real punk. I mean, he knew all the old ways. And I'm looking forward to go down there just to hear that. Three, I'm going to take three. a quick little break. I'm going to be right back. <laughs> okay. That's, we're on the right track. At least we're learning correct history, not from what they told us in the history book. That's another good thing. We know. Yeah. Uh, what we did, religion. And that's that's about it. Sean. Oh I'm um, mute out. Okay. And so what grandpa's saying, you know, he has he has some knowledge of that too because you gotta remember something. You know, uh, I'm forty four years old, but I was taught by men that were born in eighteen ninety seven to nineteen oh one. I got to be blessed to see a lot of people that were still born in the late 18 and 1800s up until all the way up until I was 13 years old. And it doesn't mean I know a damn thing. You know, a lot of people <clears throat> don't care about, they don't care about our past and our history. And so we have to do the best we can to retain it. And that's why the Ponca of Nebraska we have to get your stories while you still got elders left that remember what they heard. It's important. And down here, we have to do it. But down here, we even have complications. We got people that don't want to work with each other. We got elders that will not help each other in anything that we do. You know, Grandpa Lewis is carrying us on his back. And he did that. He's doing that. And that's a good thing. But And before that, it was Grandpa Henry. Grandpa Henry had been 95 if he was still alive. Grandpa Henry uh, lived junior. <laughs> and his punk name was Noki de Dingue. Nowhere. 
There's two ways to say no in Ponca, but that was how he said it, and it was his Ponca name of the Osage clan. And today, you guys remember, we got our Gizwater going on. Gizwater was the clan. And then also today, the Osage clan is dancing and feeding everybody. So we got two uh, organizations down here in Wadigo, Oklahoma, that are happening right now. One yeah. started on, yeah, was it Thursday or yesterday? Gizwater. Yesterday. Okay, yesterday. yesterday we'll finish them all. Yeah. And the old thing is going to end today. Monday. Monday. Oops. Cool. Monday. I saw Memorial Gail posted Day, a so, video. Yeah, Monday we're going to have oh, other yeah. things uh, yeah. happening with the whole entire tribe, but uh, it'll be done up there at the hill. And most of the time, in modern time, since I've been home, my brother Trey Howell the Third will do that because he's a honored veteran that uh, got to see combat. <coughs> he's also one of our council members. Yeah. And then usually my grandpa Wilkie Eagle, he come from McKinley Eagle, also one of the last sons of our our hereditary chief, main chief was Shongay Nikagahi, horse chief. That was son of White Eagle. That's the same line I come from. And he'll be singing and there'll be other veterans and things going on there. And so down here when on a Memorial Day, we honor our, our veterans and our loved ones that went on. And this year on our Sundance, you know, I gotta finish talking. We're gonna have a society uh a society uh sweat lodges from today, tomorrow, Monday and Tuesday. Down here at the in our Sundance grounds on Burr Hill. This land down here in Burr Hill is the land of Tatonganaji Jinga, Little Standing Buffalo. His father was Tainugazi, Yellow Buffalo Bull, also known by Yellow Bull, who I come from. On my father's side, I come from great chiefs on both sides, but on my Ponca side, on all four Little Ho, Wei Jinga, and then also. Uh, Shange Nikagahi, uh, which is horse chief, and then also Wachigahe, which you're calling little dancer, it just means little dance. Wachigahe, Jinga, that's my grandfather. He was 100 some years old. He lived to be 106 when he died down here in White Eagle, born from up north. And then the second one is was the main chief at one time, is Sindeska, Whitetail. Whitetail come from the Mon Kong clan, in which he succeeded his seat to my grandfather, Little Bear, Machu Jinga, which said that he'll never, Grandpa Little Bear was one of our most vicious, decorated, and honored and feared warriors of the Ponca people. That's all of you sitting on this thing. Mm -hmm. Come from our people, known throughout maybe 16 tribes that feared him, and they were great nations mm -hmm. at that time before smallpox hit us. And he yeah. did a lot of things, but he said when he got that seat handed over to him by White Star, and I'm not talking about White Star that was uh, Stanford White Star's father. I'm talking about way before he was born. And, and some of these people, and even our chairman down here talked about that, but he didn't understand. We're not talking about 100 years ago. Whenever that seat got succeeded to my family on the Dikida clan, that happened back, that man was born in 1803. There's a big difference. And then the, the, the white star that they're talking about here, which comes from the same family. And not a, he's not a direct line. He comes from one of the brothers because his brother, white star, did not have no children. He had daughters. Yeah. And his daughters were murdered. They were murdered and raped and scalped. Yeah. And so that's how when he asked for that deal, for someone to do four things for him, to kill an old woman, to kill a child, to kill the enemy. And every time, and, and the fourth one was when he did that was a child, woman. Oh, little girl. There was a horrible thing that our main chief asked and all the chiefs said it cannot be done. And they said, you have to pass your seat on to your brother's, your next of line brother, to him or his eldest son. And he said, no, I want this thing done. And it was done out of vengeance, which is not our way. 
because yeah. innocent people were killed in that. No worry, would take that up. But they told him there's a there's a man. He's not afraid of nobody. He kills and he fights the roughest and goes to the roughest parts of the battle. And he wears a a particular cap. It's a buffalo cap with human hair on it, with one horn. That one horn, I believe, was on his right side. Yeah, right. And that right. one horn, he had a he, horn. He had a buffalo horn. He had a vision why he did that. And that one horn saved him from a shot from the arrow to the head. It hit that horn instead of his skull. But it was part of his vision. And then when people died, he gave away and asked them, could I use your hair? And people knew that he had a vision like that. And, you know, Connie asked one time, well, why would they give the hair? He paid for that hair, but he had permission to use the hair when they cut because they lost a loved one, either died of uh, some kind of tragic accident or by, by battle getting murdered. That's just the way it was back then. Yeah. And so they days. said he had a particular yes, in the old days, in the beginning. And so anyway, he did all those things that were happening, and he and then when he done, the head chief of the Ponca people, and when we were one at one time, in the early eighteen hundreds, before we were ever corrupted by colonization, that seat was handed over to Little Bear. But he said, "I'll never take a wife. I'll never have children. I'll never." camp inside the camp circle he always camped outside maybe uh 200 500 yards away football length of a football field he never camped in this bill he said i'll always eat alone he said i'm gonna give it to my bro one of my brothers and at that time he had two brothers which were his younger than him he was the oldest was wegasapi and then thondi molly and thondi molly is grandpa lewis's line Wegasapi is my bloodline, my direct bloodline. And you don't hear much mention of any of them on there because when he wrote that book, he only talked about his own people mainly and then some of our history. And it doesn't matter if he hears this or not because I'm telling the truth on that. You know, mm -hmm. we should have we should mm -hmm. had a statue of Chief White Eagle here, but we didn't. And I'm not going to get into all that, but there should have been one here because he stayed to the death here as any chief would do. Yeah. And so all these things goes back into all these old things with the, with the beginning of our political system when we had a council. And everybody, yeah. even though they didn't agree in the beginning, they accepted it when it was handed over to Wegasapi. And then Wegasapi handed it to White Eagle. White Eagle handed it to uh, Horse Chief. And then Horse Chief, it died with him. The, the United States government said there will never be a chieftain citizenship among no tribe in the United States of America. And he was the last head, head hereditary chief at that time. And then our last chief to die amongst the Ponca people from the north and the south was Redleaf. Redleaf, yeah. Right on. I'll beg you uh, Go ahead, Sister Connie. Okay. I find it really interesting. Um, Mr. Raymond said that every Ponca was... Um, in the south by 1890 <clears throat> excuse me if you think about it this book was written in 1905 that's only 15 years later what we're reading <clears throat> that's really and, interesting and also, i think and also to touch up on what that is talking about the information he got that was is from a man that was well represented grandpa joe harry back mm. harry back Pretty harry back was a brother to harry bear yeah. And Harry Bear, mm -hmm. Harry Bear was his brother that was a Sundance, he was the Sundance chief, and then Umpa, Umpa, uh, Umpa Thonga. And then my grandfather was the presiding chief over everybody that was also a Sundancer and also one of our greatest warriors that carried war honors because we also have war honors that we didn't even get into. And I don't even yeah, know if yeah. that book, is that book Thonga? Yeah, Thonga, Thonga did it talk about our war honors? But we'll get into that later. Um, We're talking about Sundance. Yeah, I'm going to end up jumping into yeah. something totally we'll different. In. We'll get into that later. Remember yeah. that. We will. We'll re yeah. Remember this recorded. Remember war. Remember your class. War honors. Okay. Yeah. And war honors. Also, Let me write it. And so, and so we talked about we talked about uh about this and and those paints mm -hmm. and some of them paints. Right. We know what they mean, but I mean we know what they literally stood for, but we don't know the reason why because. You guys got to remember something. Most of these things happen when they have what they call 
Najee's on Ali. They had a vision. They yeah. fasted, and a lot of times they fasted four days and four nights. But either way, they had a vision, and so that vision might have been told back then, but it wasn't carried on because of interpreters and all these other things. And uh, we may never know, but it doesn't matter. We still got all these things. We still got more than a lot of people got. Oh yeah. And so hey, we're gonna let uh, let them carry on. Go ahead, let's mute and let sister go on. Oh. All right. Um, we're at the second paint. Um, there's not a whole lot left, I don't think, but still. Um, okay, the second paint. <clears throat> this second paint, as already as already noted, was worn on the third day. The dancers were painted in the lodge on this occasion, and not in the secret teepee. In costume and objects worn on the body or carried in the hand, no change was introduced from the preceding day. It remains to describe the paint of those groups which introduced a new paint. On the fourth group, <clears throat> all the dancers and the grandfather were painted alike. The body and face were painted yellow and around the breast and around the face were black circles. Fifth group, all the dancers and the grandfather were painted alike except one who was unpainted. The body was painted yellow and the face red. Surrounding the face was a row of white dots. <clears throat> Up and down each arm was a zigzag line in white and a white circle was placed on the breast. On the seventh group, the grandfather was painted differently from the dancers. His entire body was and face was painted yellow, and on the right arm was painted a zigzag line of red. These dancers were painted yellow, but on their right arm bore a line of red dots, and on their left, li left arm a zigzag line of red. On to the ninth group, the grandfather's body and face were painted orange. On one side of his face was a semicircle of blue. The bodies and faces of two of the dancers were painted yellow. Across the yellow painted face was a straight blue line. The remaining dancers of this group had a red painted body with a blue semicircle on the face. The scalp line was painted yellow. Okay, on to the third paint. That was the second paint. So now we're on the third paint. The third was the last paint worn during the ceremony and was applied in the lodge on the morning of the fifth or last day. As during the second paint, there was no change in the paraphernalia of the dancers, but there was a complete change in the paints. In the first group, the body of the grandfather was painted yellow throughout, except the upper half of the face, which was painted black. The bodies of the dancers were painted yellow, around the face and arms were encircling blue lines. Second group, the bodies of all the dancers, including the grandfather, were painted yellow. The face of the grandfather was painted red, filled in with large white dots. Around the faces of the dancers was a broad white line, and down the left arm was a zigzag line in red, and down the right arm a row of red, large red dots. The third group, the grandfather's body was painted red. Up and down each arm was a series of large white dots arranged in parallel rows. The bodies of the dancers were painted yellow with the face red, encircled by a white band. Down the right arm was a single line of large red dots, and down the left arm was a red zigzag line. On the fourth group, the bodies of the grandfather and dancers were painted yellow. That of the grandfather was giving a rough grained effect by the application to, of the finger to the wet paint. Around the face was a black circle, and on each breast was a large crescent-shaped symbol. Around the face of each dancer was a single row of large red dots. On the fifth group, the bodies of the grandfather and the dancers were painted yellow. The grandfather and two of the dancers wore on the left side of their faces a blue crescent-shaped symbol. The remaining dancers wore a straight line across the face passing over the bridge of the nose. The sixth group, the bodies of the grandfather and dancers were painted yellow. 
The face was painted red, surrounded by a row of white dots. Across the breast and shoulders, the grandfather wore ten parallel rows of white dots. The arms and bodies of the dancers were streaked with white. On the seventh group, the bodies of all the dancers and the grandfather were painted red. The face was surrounded by two rows of small green dots. The dancers wore green dots on their bodies and a white line around the face. In the eighth group, all were painted red. Rice and down the arms of the grandfather was a white zigzag line. Each dancer wore two rows of white dots around his face and four rows across his breast. One of the dancers was unpainted in the ninth group, excuse me, ninth group. One of the dancers was unpainted. The remainder were painted yellow with a red face surrounded by a row of white dots. There were three additional dots on each cheek and one on the nose. Okay, we're at the conclusion. And it says, uh, I guess this is the author's own conclusion. While it is not possible at the present time, owing to lack of more extended observation and fuller information from the priests to make an adequate characterization of the Punka Sun Dance, certain points stand out prominently and seem worthy a moment's consideration. Foremost among these is the apparent simplicity of the Punka Sun Dance as compared with that of the Cheyenne or Arapaho. It is, of course, quite possible that certain rites are conducted in the teepees of preparation, which the author has not witnessed, and which consequently are not even mentioned in these pages. But judging from what was witnessed in the secret teepees and from the method of conducting the rites incident to the construction of the Sundance Lodge proper, it seems more than probable that the secret rites were of the simplest nature. At any rate, they were, presumably, confined to the construction of the various forms of sun symbols and to the painting of the dancers. The public rites seem to be confined to those attending upon the spying, capturing, felling, painting, and raising of the center pole, and the race to the pole before it is brought to the center of the camp circle. The altar of the ceremony proper is of the simplest kind and requires, apparently, no rites for its construction, except such as may perhaps have been performed by the priest when he painted the skull in the secret teepee. Beyond this, there seems to have been no further rites of any importance connected with the ceremony until the priests and dancers returned at the end of the dance on the last day to the secret teepees of preparation. The rites on this occasion were confined to the sacrifice of water and food and the cutting from each dancer of a piece of skin from his shoulder by the priest. The last rite of the ceremony is connected with, the, with this incident. The grandfathers deposit the pieces of skin which they have removed together with the tobacco at the foot of the center pole in the Sundance Lodge. While no satisfactory account of the origin of the dance was obtained, a few points were brought out in the conversation with White Eagle. According to the belief of, excuse me, let me start that one over. According to the belief of this very earnest chief and priest, the Ponca have always performed the sun dance. The lodge itself is typical of the circle of teepees overhead. The center pole seems to be symbolic of a man, an enemy, conceived of as naked that the great medicine may see him. It's also conceived of as firewood, being of willow, which is said to be hard to kill and of a clean nature. In the fork of the pole is the nest of the thunderbird, sometimes spoken of by the Ponca as an eagle, sometimes as a brant or loon. That was B-R-A-N-T. This bird produces rain, thunder, and lightning. The altar seems to be symbolic of a fireplace. It is also spoken of as the sun which in turn is spoken of as the chief. According to Ponca mythology, in the beginning of creation was the sun or fireplace, and at that time it contained the four colors which are found in the four teepees of preparation. Next came the buffalo bull, wearing a pipe, offering himself to the people. The bull came from the interior of the earth and brought the people the paints of the lodge. Thus, the exceedingly simple altar may be said to consist of the fireplace or sun, 
the buffalo, and finally of the sage, which is symbolic of the people. In comparing the Ponca Sundance with that of the Cheyenne or Arapaho, the points of difference stand out more prominently than those of resemblance. Most important of these points of resemblance are the painted dancers, who dance with an eagle bone whistle in their mouths toward the center pole or towards the sun. The chief differences between the Ponca Sundance and that of the other group are as follows. The Ponca Sundance is an annual ceremony and not dependent upon the vow or pledge of an individual member of the tribe. The dancers neither vow to dance nor dance because they belong to some particular warrior organization, but because they are asked to do so by the priests. Instead of one secret teepee of preparation, there are four. Instead of many rites in these teepees, there are but few, and these seem to be confined to the erection of sun symbols. The lodge itself is nothing but a windbreak as compared with that of the Cheyenne or Arapaho, which is the very substantial, which is a very substantial structure. The torture which the subjects are, excuse me, the torture which the subjects in the Ponca ceremony undergo are not practiced, so far as known, by either the Cheyenne or the Arapaho. The Ponca ceremony finishes at midday, the Cheyenne and Arapaho at sunset. It should be noted, finally, that in the Ponca Sundance of today, we have a ceremony which has become perhaps much simplified in the practice and nature of its rites, and which devotes a larger proportion of its energies to the spectacular. It is quite possible that in the attitude of the priests when dancing toward the sun, they may be attempting to hypnotize the dancers, or it is possible that their actions may be explained by their having been influenced by their practice of the ghost dance. Let me see, I have a bunch of pictures. I uh, wish I could share them easily, but let's see if there's any more. Oh, I have some really good illustrations, dig on it. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess I'm sit, trying to figure in my head how to get these illustrations out. It's of the center of the teepee with the paint and the color and the directions. It's really cool. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, let me see. If, I'm trying to see if there's any more to read. Um, I think I'm at only at the end where there are only pictures. Yes. Yeah, that's the end of the words. <laughs> no more words. Thank you, Connie. Let me see if I can get. Oh, you're very welcome, hon. I hope it. I hope it was. Did I go at a good pace or? Yeah. Did I too fast. No, we got it. And Rob and I found the okay. book on the the archive, so we've been reading along with you. Yes. Oh, awesome. Yeah, she sent it. Good. She sent it to us. She sent it to the group. All right. Okay. Oh, very. Carry that's on. wonderful. Carry on. I was. Just I was just thinking of that. Okay, that book is done then. Um, uh, Mr. Raymond, do you have a copy? I know you want. You yeah. said you wanted one. Yeah, I would like to. Yeah. Gail, I think Gail can get on there and print it. Is that right, Diane? On the group. I think you, you can the one download the it from that. Yeah, mine had okay. it. It was an online version, but oh, I believe I can download it to a PDF and send it to the group. Oh, that would be very cool. Oh, I see the link. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's so great. Um, yeah, Mr. Raymond, get get Gail or I'll send Gail a message. Well, and she yeah, can get she this went, for you if you need it. Uh-huh. She went to uh the that dinner for Pastor Hedman's. Oh yes, that, okay. She's um, down there eating now, probably. I'll catch her later. <laughs> yeah. I'll catch her later. But I just want to let you know, um, if y'all need it to be printed and you can't print it, I can do that and send it to you if you want. Yeah, I found a PDF. But, uh, okay. Pardon? Yeah, I don't, was able to download it and do a PDF. Awesome. So PDFs are awesome, aren't they? Cool, thanks. I'm trying to send this to... Somewhere. <laughs> okay, Eagle, I got to figure out what one's next. 
but I we I got a lot out of that. I I think. Did you? Did. I'm glad. Oh, are you mm-hmm. kidding? Anytime. Mm-hmm. You I'm are glad a lot to do it. Like, like more participate participants back a long time ago. Mm-hmm. A lot of names. I bet you've heard a lot of those names many times. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I can. <laughs> I can. I can find those names. I got. I got the original allotment for us down here, and I got the allotment for uh, wow. Machu Naji, uh, Nioshiga, uh-huh. the clan, you know. I, mm-hmm. I got, I, I find lots of names. It's just that the way they were written, you have to, yeah, <laughs> you have to yeah. change it from English to Ponca, which is sometimes difficult. For me, <laughs> it's always oh, difficult. Yeah. yeah. But um, one, one word in Ponca, <laughs> you know, one word in Ponca, like long mm-hmm. rolling hills where there's nothing there, there's one word mm-hmm. for that. And in English, it'll take you a half of a uh, notebook page <laughs> to, to define wow. just that one word. Fun. There's several. Wow. Like, really. <laughs> I think I may have another one here, guys. Um, this is from the University of Illinois. I don't know if it's the same book. Shoot, yeah, it is. It's the same book. It's got different. It's got more pages, and I'm like, why? <laughs> the other other one only had like eighty something. This one's got, but uh, Mr. Raymond that has a lot of these little neat illustrations in it. Can you see the paint? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. There's your hail. Yeah, that's but what it's really neat. Up. There was a lot of that. Yeah, we'll make sure that you get one because that's interesting as heck. <laughs> yeah, that was a I love sent to group. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So if Gail can got, download it for you. Yeah, I got a whole bunch of pictures on my other computer back there, and mm-hmm. I've got pictures of them all dressed. Dressed up, except those oh, nice. ones with full body paints. I don't have no pictures mm-hmm. like that, but I've got, I've got Sundance pictures of them. That's so great. I'd like to share, but first I got to repair my thumb drive. <laughs> oh gosh, no! <laughs> Let me see what I, I have here. I have an oral history. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh huh. You have uh, what? I'm sorry. I got to open it up and re-solder this broken part because I was looking through it and say, why don't this work? And I noticed that there's one thing that goes in and it's it's loose. The solder's broke somehow. And I got to open it up and solder that back and then I can download those pictures of sun dancers. Get a little bit of aluminum foil. <laughs> Put some aluminum foil. <laughs> Real small, I barely see. <laughs> I'll teach Gail how to solder it back. <laughs> Good. I have. Um, this is really, really. I don't know if y'all could see this, but this is super old. It's an oral document. Uh, well, it was an oral history, and it someone typed it up. Um, it was furnished by the Duke. Indian oral history collection by the White Eagle Community Association. It's uh, called Ponca Oral History Material Collected and Transcribed by Members of the Ponca Tribe. Uh, it says really? it's uh, the Duke. In- yeah, I'm going. To, I'm getting there. <laughs> it's the beginning part of it anyway. It says the Indian. It was furnished by the Duke Indian Oral History Collection by the White Eagle Community Association which is a Ponca group, which received a grant from the National Council of Arts and Humanities to obtain Ponca Indian oral history materials. Della Warrior helped obtain the grant and the project was given the title, quote, Clyde Warrior Ponca History Project, end quote. It's not known who conducted the interviews or circumstances of taping, except where some of this information appears in the text. Uh, most of the tapes were made into the Ponca language, and these were translated into English by Hilda Davis, a Ponca. The original tapes were retained by the White Eagle Community Association. The materials in this manuscript are presumably translations made by Ms. Davis 
and it's not known what portion of the complete White Eagle collection is represented here. The materials here are reproduced exactly as they were furnished to the University of Oklahoma Duke Indian History Project, except that some titles and subtitles have been inserted to indicate breaks in subject matter. Okay, so it has a section here um, where William Collins Sr. is telling about the Sundance. And uh, at the, it says he's going to talk here about the Sundance, the 101 Ranch, Racehorse, Gypsies, War Dance, Games, Pipe Dance, and Ghost Dance. And it's just basically where someone transcribed what he was talking about. Is that all, you want me to read the whole thing, Eagle? Or just do you want me to pop down to the Sundance part? I don't think he might are. have you <laughs> muted because he's driving. I can I see him so. moving. Yeah. But, what do you guys see. think? You want to just read the? <laughs> you want to read the whole thing, guys, or you want to just do the Sundance part? Oh heck, let's just read it. What do y'all think? Let's read it's it. <laughs> almost. Two. We got like we got like an hour, hour and fifteen minutes. Yeah, let's go for okay. it. Okay, he says. Yeah, go for it. Let's go for it. If I, okay, y'all yell at me if I go too fast, too slow, or anything like that. Okay, here we go. It says, I am William Collins Sr., a member of the Ponca Tribe of Indians of Oklahoma. I am now 72 years of age. Um, hold on, let me see if I can find a date. Shoot. There's no date right off. Maybe it'll come. I was born July 17th, 1897. So someone add 72 to 1897, and that'll tell us what year it is. <laughs> On this reservation, so he is 72. He was born July 17th, 1897 on this reservation. So he was born in Oklahoma. I attended Ponca Training School in 1903. I was six years old. This school was practically run on reformatory rules. Rules are very strict. Okay, this is going to get graphic about children. Does Is anyone particularly worried, you know, whether anybody gets some triggering or anything? Are we good? No, but yeah, anyone watching this good. video, <laughs> pause it. Because <laughs> uh, skip this part. Yes, yeah, that's a good idea. That's very good. Thank you very much. I forgot we were recording it. So, trigger warning, people: children and violence and boarding school stuff's coming up. So, um, if you want to can, stop, now's a great time. I can tell. I can tell okay, you um, on that. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, some of my people went to. I I attended Ponca Training School in 1903. I was six years old. This school was practically run on reformatory rules. Rules were very strict. Boys played on their side and the girls on their side. I guess on the of, of the room. We were not permitted to talk our own Ponca language. If we talked our language, we were punished by taking our playing privileges for three days. The older boys were punished by being strapped or locked in a dark cellar or dungeon. When they were taken to do wood splitting or chopping, they were chained to a 50-pound ball of steel. We were punished for all petty offenses, like going on the girls' side to get a ball, not sweeping clean or mopping with a dirty mop. Offenses were committed everywhere. Large boys were punished for their petty offenses in their way, too. Medical treatment was not much. as we had the old army doctors. Our whole school at one time was operated on for trachoma and ulcers, and even some who did not need this operation. Okay, um, maybe it was the tonsils, I don't know. Smallpox hit the school as no vaccine was available and children died like flies. Some children were stolen by their folks and these survived. <clears throat> well, so much for our schooling as we could not go higher than the fourth grade or be 15 before our before we could go to Shalako, Haskell, or Carlisle Indian School. Um, let me reread that just to clarify. Well, so much for our schooling as we could not go higher than the fourth grade or be 15 before we could go to Shalako, Haskell, or Carlisle Indian Schools. Our food was not much. We had food that was practically U.S. Army rejects, such as hardtacks, prunes, beans, dried peaches, dried apples, oatmeal, and crackers. They always had bugs in them. 
We never did, <clears throat> excuse me, we never did know a good fried meat or bacon and eggs. <clears throat> excuse me, we all had clipped heads, narrow-waisted shirts, and short uniform caps. Well, so much for our schooling. Now the punkas were brought to the area around the area around northeastern part of the state of Oklahoma. In 1879, in 20 days or stops, they suffered untold hardship. One of our main chiefs died there in the Quapaw area with many old people on account of the weather and bad water, which had minerals in it. So they looked for another place for better water and other facilities until they came to the present Ponca Reservation. They first built the Ponca Indian Agency at a place now called White Eagle Agency. Excuse me. Um, from there, they chose different places to live in their teepees. This land of 100,000 acres was brought from, bought from the Cherokees. Mixed bloods living in the Chickasaw Chickasia, River to the west side of the reservation. Um, so the mixed bloods lived there on the yes. west side of the reservation by that river. Full blood settled along the Arkansas River, and some lived along the Bois d'Arc Creek, first time pronouncing that, <laughs> or anywhere there was some water and some good grass and trees. I'm sorry? Yeah, that river is Chikaski. <laughs> oh, yeah, Chikaski. They spelled it yeah. really and that, weird. And that, that creek is called Bulldog. Yeah, Bulldog Creek. But, okay, too. I know it's French, but <laughs> the French didn't come. <laughs> I didn't get it. Jukaski, they spelled it really weird. Yeah. They immediately built houses that were needed. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do you have something else? No. Okay. I thought someone said something. Okay. Um, they immediately built houses that were needed, such as blacksmith shops for shoeing horses and repairing and making wagons, supplies, and a carpenter shop to make homemade caskets and corrals for cattle for rationing purposes and commissary warehouses for food rations. Next was a school building for the children, which was done mostly by Indian labor, overseen by a white carpenter. They made their own bricks for this school and they had a sawmill making lumber for the school and the homes for the Poncas. After the allotment of the land to the Indian of 80 acres suitable for farming, 40 acres was given for pasture or for grass. 40 acres as a poor land or a good 80 acres and a pasture of 40 acres. The lumber was used to build log houses, some of which were still standing when Ponca City came with their better grade of lumber. Some were stubborn or still lived in their teepees on their allotments. The agent was usually a cast off or retired military man, majors and such who were very strict. Okay, remember this is a, a translate, this is, you know, um, typed out as somebody speaking. I can't think of the word. So it's, you know, spoken that way. Um, Ponca Sundance. This is the legend of the Plains Indian Sundance ceremony as told by Edward Packhorse Primo, translated by William Cullen Sr., and also a member of the Ponca tribe of Indians of Oklahoma. This dance to the sun was brought here by the Poncas from the land of the northern part of Nebraska from which the Poncas were removed in 1877. Um, in parentheses, the Sundance was prohibited by the U.S. government in 1897 as it was too cruel, in parentheses. In the month of August, when the sun was at its highest and the moon was in full, the chiefs got together in council and talked about going into encampment for the annual Sundance. The appointed leaders, butchers, buffalo police, and invited various or surrounding tribes to take part in this four-day affair. Uh, okay, I think I read that a little wrong. The appointed leaders, butchers, buffalo policed and invited various or surrounding tribes to take part in this four-day affair. The standing buffalo family who had the Ponca peace pipe were asked to be the first to put up their teepee and select a place for the camp. After this was done, the whole tribe pitched their teepees in a circle around this pipe teepee. Men were asked to build a circular brush area, arena, excuse me, a circular brush arena for the dancers. This was done voluntarily. After this was done, the different tribes of Osages, Ka, Oto, Pawnees, and Cheyennes, and Sac and Fox were given a place outside of the Ponca circle or camp 
as they did not allow any tribe to camp in the Ponca Circle of its own camp. When everything was in order, the head men of the camp elected four or five men to go and look for a tall, stately willow and cut and trim the tree of its branches, leaving a little at the top. This tree was the sacred tree and was found by a young warrior on a scouting mission. He told of finding a tree that was slight at night by some mysterious way and that the Thunderbirds were using it for a roost. It seemed that this tree had four paths leading to it, or the four winds and the creatures that came to it left their skeletons and skulls at the base of the tree. So that is how the Poncas prepared to attack it and kill it like a human being. Afterwards, it was brought by horses and a wagon without a box and hauled to the west side of the Sundance Lodge. The main body of Poncas on horseback were with this group following with their gifts to be given away at the tree cutting ceremony. As the tree was hauled back to the camp, the warriors on horseback put on a sham battle. As the warriors came towards the camp, would you say that was called, Mr. Raymond, the sham battle? Had a word? <laughs> yeah, okay. I got it. <laughs> it okay. was uh, Egadize. Egadize. Yeah. Egadize. Okay, thank you. Okay, so they... Uh, they put on the Ega Dize, which is a sham battle. I'm going to try to remember to say that. <laughs> as the warriors came towards the camp, they came as a tornado would, round and around until they took the camp. Every man had his horses camouflaged with grape vines and leaves, hand prints of red, white, or black, eagle feathers on their tails, and broadcloth around his horse's throat, a good saddle or blanket, and their shields and a high-powered rifle and six-shooter for close fighting and a scout knife, war bonnet for the chiefs, and all kinds of ornaments for the warriors like roaches, eagle, hawk, and crow feathers. After circling the camp by fours, they were singing their war songs and the women folks were cheering. The old men that did not go where, excuse me, the old men that did not go were talking and encouraging the young braves and older warriors and complimenting them for the great thing that has happened this day. After they circled the Sundance Lodge, the drummers were there and sang the chief's songs and white horse riders dance. This dance is in honor of the chiefs. Anybody helping or taking part had to give a gift worthy of the chiefs or something of great value to them or to help them excuse me, or to help someone whom they feel is in need. At this time, the young men made their horse dance, excuse me, at this time, the young men made their horses dance just like a high school horse today. The old man or the older warriors made their horses walk backward and then forward at the closing of the song. These horses that were ridden in the sham battle were all given away to friends or to different tribes. After this, the participants of the Sundance went to their respective sacred lodges where the leader had a special prepared last meet for the fourth day ritual. During the night, their clothes were taken away from them by relatives and given a sheet and a breech cloth, red bead ornament, red bead ornament around their shoulder to their waists. I'm going to guess that's the bandolier. The sheet was worn during the day like a dress from the waist down or a cover for the night. Articles furnished by the leader of the group was sage weed for the ankles, wrists, and hair, eagle bone whistles with an eagle plume on the end, painting of the participants according to their clan. Painting of their faces was most remarkable, as you could hardly recognize one from another dancer. After this readiness, you could sleep, preparing for the run, for the tree that was to be planted in the center of the Sundance Lodge. Excuse me. <clears throat> the workers or leaders <clears throat> had been working on the sacred pole. This ceremony was usually made by a man who had been wounded and his helpers were warriors in their own right. They stripped the bark from the tree to make a cross. The trunk was placed as a human with the war colors of the Poncas, red and black. A black handkerchief was tied under the treetop, fluttering to tell the Almighty the prayers of the leaders, dancers, and the people. When this was completed, four lodges were erected by the Sundance leaders for their participants, two on the east side 
and two on the west side inside the main camp. After this was done, the dance leaders looked around for new dancers. A man was sent to the families who would likely have male members who could participate. If the boy or man refused to take part for some reason, he or his family had to give a gift to refuse the honor bestowed upon them by the leader of the Sundance. The gift was a new blanket, horse, or beef given to the camp. Well, the preparation has been complicated for the first day. Early the next morning, the town crier awakens the camp by telling everybody to get up as they are going to run for the tree. People come out at dawn, rubbing their eyes and looking toward the Sundance Lodge. All the men who are to dance are all lined up. A chief, White Eagle, was talking to the men who were going to run for the sacred pole, which is now ready. Old man White Eagle is telling the man from his horse that he is going to give four whoops, W-H-O-O-P-S, and on the fourth whoop, they must run with all their strength, never to look back, use all of your powers if you have any, think about the swiftness of hawks, eagles, deer, mountain lion, bear, or anything that can help you. I call you all warriors because you're running to the foe. I call you all warriors because you're running to the foe. Look to the man who is pointing to the sacred tree when he drops the blanket after I holler the fourth time. The men are like fast horses, ready and quivering. The last whoop, and they are off. As the runners run over the slain sacred tree, the judge calls out the winner's name, calls the man who came in second, third, and fourth. These men have the honor of standing in their respective order as they came in the race. Any man who falls in this race must not get up until the leaders who have been running behind the runners come and take a piece of his flesh with an awl stuck through his arm and clipped off. Then he can get up and join the other runners in the rear. The sacred tree is taken to the Sundance Lodge. The men stop four times <clears throat> before getting to the Sundance Lodge. Each time the pole is put down. A great applause and cheering is set up by both man and woman. When the pole is set up, the dancers all go to their leader's sacred lodge. Ornaments are set up like sageweed, placed to the four winds or directions. A painted buffalo skull is placed on these sages to remind the people that we will all go back to skull and eventually dust. Here is something for all to respect. Araponka peace pipe is placed in all its glory on top and leaning on the buffalo skull with a bowl filled with tobacco bowl on the west side and the pipe stem or mouthpiece facing facing the east. A crescent of the sun and moon, a large one, was made toward the rising sun with four pieces of firewood laid on the inside of this crescent. Four markings were drawn on top of the crescent representing the four winds or directions. Now the area is complete. Sage is placed for the dancers with canvas to sit on. The Sundance Lodge was built in circular shape, opening on top and the entrance to the east. Bent willows formed a shade with branches and covered with canvas on top. Teepee poles with long calico or goods was placed on the east side of the ground by the family for each dancer. Here the family placed food, groceries, blanket, or a whole string of horses or one good horse to give away in the dancer's honor. Smoking hot food was given to the drummers. When too much food was brought, they gave it to the people who were there. This food was a sort of temptation and made the men try that much harder. When the dance started on the first day, all the participants were brought from the four sacred teepees and lined up early in the morning, all facing east towards the rising sun. All the participants raised their right hand to the sun and cried and prayed with their leaders for the Almighty giver of life on this earth to take pity on them, their family, and the Ponca people, as well as other tribes in the area. Then the drummer sang a song to the sacred pipe. After this song, another starting song was sung, and then a song to the peace pipe again, and then to the sun of which there were many. They danced till noon and then took a short rest period. Then a leader would take his bunch of dancers and dance in a group, then go back to their seats. Then another group would dance the same way. Then they would all get up and dance three or four songs. This would keep on all day long, the men facing the sun all day until the song was sung ending the day. 
The men slept, all heading toward the sacred pole, the pipe skull, and the ornaments around the fireplace. At night, the Buffalo police patrolled around the tent or lodge to see that no deserters got away. If a deserter was caught, he was returned to his leader and decided to do his punishment, which was a release, a good talking to, or in a case of a young boy, he could be let off for the night and dance the next day or be completely sent back because of pity that he was so young and can't stand the ordeal of a man. A man who was sincere was a man to be admired and respected. You do not laugh in his presence. You talk easy and kindly to him, and he will do the same to you. These men are not spoken back to. You have to go along with them. The dance was the same all through the four days of it. The people or a relative of a dancer <clears throat> gave away with his permission any horse or blanket or money to show the unselfishness, unselfishness of the dancer and their own gifts to the goodness of the sun giver of life, health, crops, and all the great things here on earth. <clears throat> when the dance was completed, the men were assembled near the sacred teepees and the sacrifice of their flesh began. <clears throat> this was for the full health for the year, the health of relatives, crops, and food throughout the year. The relatives in good health and in poor health also gave up a piece of their arm as a sacrifice. And all AWL was punched through the skin near the shoulder and the puffed part exposed was cut in a sort of a dip on the exposed part. Every scar on a shoulder represented how many dances a man or a relative gave sacrifice in their lives. <clears throat> After this, they were fed by a man who knew the job of putting a man back to his normal way of eating. A little food at first, just a pinch, about one or two inches square, just a little dab of meat, rice, a pinch of bread and fruit. For their first taste of water, this was before the food, a sage weed of four pieces was touched on each dancer's lips. It sat satisfied a man like a good cup of water. After this, more water was given and then the food. When the main food was given to them and everybody finished, there was a little talk by the leader praising the men for their fortitude, faithfulness, and their completion of the great Ponca Indian sun dance. Then they all changed back to their civilian clothes brought by relatives, and the people broke camp and went to their respective homes. The Sundance Lodge and the Sacred Pole was left to the elements. <clears throat> Anyone need a break? Keep going. We all good? Good. Okie doke. Some tribes joined in this dance, about three or four Otos, some Pawnees, and Cheyennes. These people were honored, but the relatives got their gifts and put them away for them until after the dance. There were other attractions, such as horse races, foot races, or Joe and Bill Pickett were giving bulldogging exhibitions. The 101 Ranch had their big top up, or a stand, and beef was given for the four days. Everybody had meat drying in the sun to take home after the Ponca Sun Dance. The visiting tribes were all given beef, too. There was no water on the tribal grounds. Water was hauled in a barrel on a big wagon with a tablecloth on top and a barrel ring to hold the cloth in its place over the barrel. Most of the water was taken from big wooden windmills from the 101 Ranch home. The Indian boys watered the horses by driving them to the river. There was a pond southwest of the camp, but it was kept dirty by the Indian boys all the time because they went swimming every day. Okay, experience riding a racehorse. Um, here's an incident that's typical of Indian life. Albert Waters and I went to see the horse races about 10 or 12 in number. We went to where they were starting. We saw a boy there by the name of Snake. He told Albert and I that he was afraid of the racehorse he was on. Crazy me, I said, all right, I'll ride him. I was 12 years old and my dad had gotten me a gentle horse and a good saddle. So I didn't have any business on a fast horse. This horse looked like a 15 or 20 story building when I was riding on top. Well, he told me to watch the man by the camp. When he twirls a blanket and it drops, it's time to go. I was afraid a little when I saw older boys on the other horses. Finally, everybody shouted, get ready. We got in some kind of a ragged line. Oops, excuse me. And I, I heard someone say, everybody keep your eye on that man. 
When I looked, he dropped that blanket. Everybody went, so I joined in. Boy, this this white horse, excuse me, boy, this white racehorse was fast. Before I knew what had happened, I was in the lead. Boy, if you are young and hear the thundering of hooves back of you, you're going to look back, which is a mortal sin in racing, I found out later. I saw the horses running low, ears back, nostrils extended, eyes looking like they were going to pop out of their sockets. I got scared and wanted to get back into the crowd. We were about to the halfway mark when I started to pull my horse to get back to where I thought it was a safe place. When I pulled him back, no go. I pulled his head back, but his legs were still running, so I jerked hard on the lines about two or three times, and they were snap lines. I jerked one line off, pulling back and forth. With one line, I started turning north. I got away from the race, but I had a runaway racehorse, which I could not stop. Well, I guess other boys on horseback saw me and shouted, run away. <laughs> About 50 boys chased me north. It was just like a Model T car chasing a Buick. <laughs> My horse saw a buggy about two miles away and headed right for this team. I jumped big rocks, ditches, and what have you on a prairie. I turned the line loose and hung onto the horse's mane. No chance of jumping. Why, I might as well jump from a modern car at 50 or 60 miles an hour. Well, I ran into the two old Indians who had been to see their homes to see if everything was all right. I ran into the horse's full speed. He nearly knocked the poor horses into the Salt Fork River. I went into the front part of the dashboard onto the tongue and the bow. Boy, my nose was bleeding. <laughs> Fortunately, it wasn't broken. I was skinned all over. My shirt and pants were torn. And all the old men could say was boo-hoo, boo-hoo. <laughs> In Ponca, boo-hoo meant something like, oh my gosh. Well, they caught my horse, tied him with their horses, and I got in the back. I did not know what to do, cry or catch help from my father and mother. I knew they would punish me by taking away the privilege of riding again. I felt pretty bad. Finally, we met my dad and grandfather in a single buggy. They asked the old Indians, how is he? They said I was all right except for my bloody nose and being skinned up some. So I changed buggies and went back with my father. I thought he would get after me, but he didn't. He said, son, you had your own horse and saddle. Why did you ride a horse that you did not know? I could not answer. When we got back to camp, it seemed that all my relatives were there. Some of the women folks were crying, but when they saw I was all right, they wiped away my tears and spoke gently to me. I went into the teepee and covered my face and body, sitting up as people came to see me. <laughs> this way I saw no one, as I was very ashamed and hurt. My father went and told one of the town criers that he was sorry that this had happened to him and his family and was glad to know and see that I was not hurt too bad. He said he gave a beef in my honor to the people. We had some cattle, and I knew he would make his word good. So that is the one incident. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. So that is, oh, gosh. So that is the one incident that I wanted to tell you in a foot race or a horse race. <laughs> Never look back. That's the point of the story. <laughs> Don't look back. I have a friend who lives in Puerto Rico, and she's very tiny, and we've known each other since, like, the seventh grade, and she wanted to be a horse jockey, and she is a horse jockey. She was one of the leading horse jockeys in Puerto Rico, and she, I, I bet she knows that lesson, too. <laughs> okay, we have a story of a buffalo chase. Are we all in? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Buffalo Chase at the 101. In the year of 1905, June 5th to 9th, was the big Buffalo Chase. The old 101 Ranch entertained the National Editors Association <clears throat> on the old Sundance grounds or tribal grounds two miles north of Bliss, Oklahoma Territory, or the present town of Marland, Oklahoma. I believe Raymond just stated that. That's where it was. Editors came from all parts of the United States and visitors from all over the country. Trains of over 33 coaches were common. People with no room on the train stood on top of the coaches. They poured out of the trains like sheep and cattle. Tickets were sold for the four days, red, green, blue, or yellow. <clears throat> Woe to the one who did not have a gunny sack bag in sight, fluttering from their shirt buttonholes. Rosette pins, 
of the Indian chiefs with red, white, blue, and blue ribbons were good for four days. If you did not have these tickets, you were escorted by the Buffalo police to the ticket office or out you go off the grounds. <clears throat> the old prisoner of war, Geronimo, was here with a camp full of soldiers from Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He led the prairie every day with a United States flag in a 1902 Ford. Geronimo was also given the privilege of shooting a buffalo with bow and arrow, which was finished off by a cowboy <clears throat> with a high-powered rifle. He was also allowed to eat with the Ponca Indian chiefs, partaking of buffalo meat, fry bread, and coffee. My father, being a chief, ate in this, din in this dinner with Geronimo and the Ponca chiefs. I was around Geronimo a lot as I was a mischievous, mischievous little Ponca child, as we should be. I would pat him on the back, at which he would turn quickly and smile. White children were afraid of him with the soldiers guarding him and keeping the overly curious way. We were not afraid of the soldiers or Geronimo. My father was treasurer for the Poncas, and they would count the money at night in our teepee. The Buffalo police would patrol around the teepee for outlaws, of which there were plenty. I don't know what they did with the money, but there was no ration, no rationing of groceries. <clears throat> My dad would not give me 50 cent, which I always wanted him to sneak to me. Instead, he reached in his own pocket and told me to go buy a pop. Joe Miller, always a showman, pulled a trick on the editors and their wives by telling them that the Indians were eating dog cooked as their special dish. He had some dogs killed and their heads cut off and their heads placed around the teepee door so the white people could see what they, the editors and their wives, thought the Indian chiefs with Geronimo were feasting on. Some could take it, some could not, and turned away sick. They would ask Joe Miller, is that what they're eating? <clears throat> and he would tell them that the dog is their favorite food for the visiting man in whose honor they were eating. I guess that should have been like a warning right there. I didn't know. <clears throat> the chiefs, let me I have a drink. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what's wrong with my throat. Pardon me? Are you talking, Eagle? No, no one's talking, Connie. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought I heard him say something. Thank you. The chiefs, after a hearty meal of buffalo, fry bread, and coffee, asked Geronimo to say a few words. Of course, this was all given in the sign language, thanking the good Ponca chiefs and the people who made the food possible. Then he told about the chase of the buffalo and running with their wives and children, always a running fight with the soldiers. He said it felt good to be among his kind of people. So each chief took his hand as a fellow warrior. As each Indian left for his teepee, soldiers took Geronimo in handcuffs back to the arena or the big rodeo grounds. <clears throat> this arena seated about 40,000 people and was like a big football field. The bleachers broke in the southwest corner and went down with many people getting hurt and killing a small child. Wow, that's bad. The 101 ranch owners gave the Ponca 16 beefs. Four were killed every day for the Indians. <laughs> This was the stand rights. They had a regular store, everything in the grocery line, buffalo meat, buffalo meat sandwiches sold for a dollar. Souvenirs were everywhere. <clears throat> Carnival at night, moving pictures at an open air dome at night, which was a novelty. Prices were five cent for children and 10 cent for grownups. The soldiers were from Fort Sill and camped southwest of the Indian camp. Ponkas were still a little wild, and they had their best horses staked back on their teepees, always alert. Bill Pickett, the Negro bulldogger, was doing his stunt every day. Bill would chase a steer with another cowboy or hazer and keep the steer running straight. Then Bill fell on the steer's head, grabbed his horns running at full speed, twist head, biting his lip with his strong teeth, and stop him with his legs used as brakes. When he threw the steer on his side or back, he would signal everything under control. Then he would let the steer up with his bleeding lip and wobble away. The other cowboy, standing by to see that Bill did not get into any danger, would pick him up and take him to a place of safety. Interesting. But boy, that was bad. <laughs> I feel fine. I don't know what's wrong with my throat. <clears> throat> it just sounds funny. 
Gypsies and Cowboys. Um, another chapter I remember was the people who called themselves the Brazilians. I thought they were just gypsies. They were a traveling bunch of about 104 wagons, good harnesses, and a lot of children. They came to the 101 ranch from the south. A few purchased some tobacco and groceries. While this was going on, others came in, and clerks and the Negro butcher could not handle the people, and they helped themselves. The store operator and employees had to run for help from George L. Miller. They drove them out with a six-shooter. Then Joe L. Miller came, and the people said they wanted to camp for the night, rest their horses, and move on the next day. Joe told them to go to camp at the mouth of the, I'm sorry, um, Boy Dark Creek. I can't remember what he said. As there was plenty of pasture and woods. I'm sorry. Boy Dark. Did you say Boy Dark? Boy Dark. Boy, okay. Bodoc. Like Bodoc. Bow, 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 bow. Oh, boy, like boy, bow, bow. B -A -U -B -O -S. No, like a bow, like a bow and arrow, bow, duck. Yes, bow, duck. Okay, thank you. I'll try to remember that. At the mouth of the boy, duck creek, as there was plenty of pasture and wood to cook with. So the caravan went on their way to this place where an Indian by the name of Albert Primo lived with his wife and children. They all camped around his home for the drinking water and for cooking. As usual, they soon entered his home wanting to tell his fortune. The old man did not understand, so they overran his home, cleaned out his chickens and groceries. The 101 Ranch was the closest he could think of as they leased his land. So he took his family by buggy, lucky to get away. Joe Miller told him the people would move on in the morning. He told the old Indian that he would give him the groceries that he had lost and some chickens. Well, the old man, Mr. Primo, had to sleep somewhere, so he went back. He went to his relatives up north about three miles. When daybreak came, the gypsies were still there, so the Indian went to the 101 ranch to tell Joe they were still there. Joe told his cowboys to go over and tell any of them to move on or scare them into moving. All the cowboys were glad to do something for a change. So they all went there and told them the big boss said to move on. Some had not caught their horses and were slow. Some were cooking, feeding the horses, and hooking up their horses to the wagons. As usual, somebody shot into the air to scare or hurry them up, but this only started the fireworks. The cowboys started shooting to hurry them up. Some people got wounded here and there. One baby died. I don't know whether it was shot or if it died from natural causes. Well, anyway, there was confusion everywhere. The men folks were trying to catch their horses. Some were pulling out and away from this place. They assembled on the Ponca Cemetery, their wagons stretching all the way from the north gate to a good one half mile south. They all stopped here to rendezvous. Some men went to look for a phone. <clears throat> there were only one or two. There were only two or one at the 101 Ranch and at my grandfather Charlie Collins's place. A man came to our house and said he wanted to call all the doctors and nurses in town, as many people needed medical attention. After he got through, he asked my dad to take him back to the cemetery. I did not want to, as this man was shot in the upper lip and looked pretty rough to me. And the old man said, take him back. I said my horse didn't ride double, but he said that was all right. So he jumped on behind me and my horse started bucking, but he was a good rider and held me from falling off. My horse soon quit bucking and I took him back. When I got there, some woman, some women came crying with a baby in their arms and showed it, showed it to him. He got off my horse and stood on his hind legs and wheeled toward home. I took like a sacred rabbit. Okay, I guess that means he ran. I don't know. Well, I went down the hill full speed until I met the doctors, nurses, and sightseers, and I turned back to the cemetery. I remember seeing Dr. Panton, P-A-N-T-O-N, Dr. Robertson, and some other doctors. <clears throat> they got busy and started treating women who were shot through the legs and finally turned away bashfully and started flirting with the little gypsy girls. I don't know where I picked up Albert Waters, but he was riding double with me, so we went sightseeing. The doctors had done their job and wanted their pay for their services, and here's where the trouble started again. It seems like they thought the fees were too high or they had some misunderstanding. These people did not have too much education and did not understand where they had to pay individually or for the whole train. 
finally, finally, they took the matter to the queen. <clears throat> Boy, did she tongue lash the doctors, even bringing about the shooting, which she said the cowboys should be made to pay. She said, if my man did not take my gun, I would have killed me some cowboys this morning. Quote, end quote. While the woman was talking, the doctors, men and everybody was trying to say something. The doctor told her the fee was $100. The queen reached into her bag and threw the $100 in gold at Dr. Panton's chest. He would not pick it up, but amid the loud profanity, somebody picked it and gave it to the doctor. After, excuse me, after this, everybody started moving again towards Ponca City. The police turned them away from the city as they were troublesome, a troublesome bunch of people. They stole every place they watered their horses or purchased eggs or milk for the children. The last I heard of them, they had stolen a saddle, chickens, and groceries from some more Indians, but these were recovered by the sheriff of Newkirk and brought back to the Indians here in Ponca City. And that's the end of that story, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> okay, so back to uh, <laughs> the things that we read, you know, it's just uh, give us some information that were translated by Ponca, you know, and I hate to say that, but a lot of these books that are wrote, they got half truths to them, or partial truths and stuff. Yeah. And these books yeah, that we read, they were translated by Ponca, Ponca interpreters, what they call Ieska. Ieska means the interpreter or translator. So back to what it is, you know, we're inviting all the Poncas from Nebraska and all over the United States. Our second annual Sundance will be held starting on June 22nd, 23rd. 24th and 25th it'll end and we'll have a big dinner that day but we'll be feeding every single day feeding that means morning lunch and breakfast we've got a lot of money that we're going to be giving in our in our food and uh giveaways that our organization has and it's all self uh it's all done by ourselves we don't got nobody giving us money or nothing you know and we might uh, have a few people uh, last year, Dr. Um, Anitra Warrior donated money and uh, Secretary Treasurer Carla Carney donated money and uh, various other people helped out a little bit with our food and costs. So we're real thankful for that. And uh, if people feel it in their heart to help donate, you know, we got cash app or different things we do for that, but mostly it's it's all our money. All our work money, everything we're working for, we, we donated to that. You know, last year I gave my I gave everything I had uh, to help put this on, and I also lost my job over it through the tribe based on uh, they didn't want us to do it. But like I said, you know, I'm going to give you a little history. My grandfather, Sylvester Warrior, is one of my grandpas. His son, he's got uh, two surviving sons left, and he's got four surviving children. The oldest being Grandpa Vincent Warrior, or Vincent Bold Warrior, Sherman Bold Warrior, and his two daughters are Wilma Bold Warrior and um, Anita Bold Warrior. <clears throat> and when they had, a, when, the, when the government brought us down here, they took four ceremonies from us. They took our sacred pipe, said we couldn't do that in the, in the public, and we still have that pipe to this day. I can't tell you where it's at, but it's used. The way it was instructed in songs are sung before and after it's uh, used and it's blessed with a cedar and kept in a certain way by one of our elders. He's also a fluent speaker. And they took that Nini Bawaku Bay. That's the only thing that we call a sacred pipe. Everything else is a Nini Bake or Nini Baka or used in a different way, but we don't add that Hube or Waku Bay on the back of it. And then they took our our Sundance, me and Don't Be Watching. They took that from us 109 years ago this year, but uh, 110 years ago this year. But last year, the 109th year, we brought it back to our Ponca people. And every elder that we spoke to was on board and didn't have no things to say, don't put it away, except our chairman said he just wasn't going to support it. And that was fine. And... We had other uh, council members that uh, said they were going to come. We had a couple come and look on, you know, uh, uh, Councilwoman Carla Carney, Councilwoman Matilda De La Garza, 
and uh, Robert Collins pledged to come, but he didn't show up. You know, maybe he had some kind of business or whatever it may be. I don't know, but he didn't show. And we had Ponca Alders and some of our one of our peyote men came named Dwight Buffalo Head. And, you know, he supported us. And he to this day, we need prayer requests for him because he's going through a lot of hardship. His name is Dwight Buffalo Head. It's my uncle, my mother's brother. And he's going through a lot of hardship, but he'll, I know that no matter how sick he is with cancer, or, go on, get out of here. I'm sitting here, all these dogs are sitting behind me, and that puppy's crying because I won't pet it. Maybe I should pet it, but I ain't. And so, anyway, I know my Uncle Dwight will be there in whatever state he's in, and depending on how sickly he is from his uh, heart and uh, his cancer, you know, we're going to be dancing for him, people like him. We're going to be dancing for them children that are orphans. We're going to be dancing for the missing and murdered women of our indigenous Native American tribes. We're going to be dancing for those that have given up. We're going to be dancing for those that are struggling with meth addiction, alcoholism, those that have been raped, those that have been molested, those that uh, feel like there's no hope left. I'm 44 years old this year. And I'm going to be dancing. That's a young man's dance. But a majority of us in that deal are over 40. My daughter, last year, she danced since she was 12 years old. She was the youngest punka, woman punka dancer in the history of our people. Now, give all that. We need to see a call. And we're going to do the best we can. I think there's some more about the Sunday thing to happen for our people. I know that you guys are just reading the stories of over a hundred years ago, but we brought it back to our people. We're praying for Ponca unity from the north to the south, from the east coast to the west coast. We're praying that our Ponca people come home, even though up north they still live up that way. But all our ceremonies were brought here. All our bundles were brought here. Our ceremonies are still carried on today, and we want to share that with our Ponca people from all over the Turtle Island. You know, see these, these people going through this, these women. All the women were 40 or some years old, and some of them in their 50s that danced, except for my daughter and my daughter, Jewel Hornick. You know, Gail came and watched. Grandpa came and watched. You know, hopefully we'll get them to dance. Even even if Grandpa, even Grandpa Raymond, even if you come out there and dance a few rounds, you'll be our oldest punk member to date dancing. And that's what I had in my vision, that there would be men dancing the older than me on my left and right side of me. It's hard to speak about this stuff without getting emotional. Don't ever forget who you are. Don't think no matter how far you are, don't think because you're mixed with other tribes or with other races. Don't forget who you are. You're Ponca. You are Ponca. In this class here, you guys are the front line holding our language. Don't give up. When you feel like giving up, ask God to give you strength. Tell him. God, help me. I got hardship in my life, but you know that already. That's what I just said. I'm not a fluent speaker, but do I know the language? I do. I was taught by my loved ones. I was taught by good elders. I was taught by a lot of men. My greatest teacher in this punk language was to date that carried me further than even my own great-grandfather, Simon Horse Chief Eagle, my mo grandmother, Annabelle, my grandmother, Ivy Little Standing Buffalo Rod, my grandmother, Aline Little Standing Buffalo Rod, my uncle, Harry Buffalohead, Linge, Wongede, Dingai, they're all gone. Except for Grandpa Lewis. Grandpa Lewis, you know, he's a great man. I don't care what nobody says about him. I'll always stand in his stead for him. When he needs help and calls on me, I'll always be there. Until God said, come home. I'll be there for our people. I'll stand there. I might not be never, never anything much more than I am today. Just a helper, but that's okay. I don't have to be a head man. I don't have to be a chief. I don't have to be a clan leader. I don't have to be the one that's always talking. 
I'm happy with just helping and, and giving information to our Ponca people. And I hope that someday I can meet some of you in real life. I hope that someday that we could share water, share food, share smoke. In the old days, when a Ponca smoked with somebody, gave them water, gave them food, they were protected. They were Their life was protected on that ancient ceremony of giving. People don't even talk about that. I didn't read that one time yet in that Thondown Molly. And my grandfather carried as far as he can. And we have to honor that. This dictionary, we have to honor that. We have to pray for guidance in this dictionary, this virtual dictionary we're going to do. We have to honor that. <clears throat> we have to do all that we can in the most simplest, humble way by asking God to be with us every step of the way. When we feel like giving up, ask for strength. When we feel like we can't do it or we don't know what to do, ask God for guidance. Remember, every one of you sitting in this class and those of you are going to hear this, you got that same voice, you got that same mind to call upon God. To know that He's everywhere, that He created everything. And Dr. Blue God, it up I know that He created everything. I'm okay, don't you? It does. Where? It up on. I know that. You guys know that too. And don't ever forget. I'm not saying believe in, a, believe in a Christian Bible. I'm not saying believe in Buddha or Muhammad or anybody. I'm not disrespecting that either. What I am saying is don't forget your prayer life. And those of you that I get to help and encourage to pray, I'm honored to sit here today with you, to hear you pray. I'm honored here today to know that you guys are making that attempt because it's hard. It's hard. It's a hard way to live. It's a hard way to live, and I do the best I can. I got people talk about me. You're going to have people talk about you in your lifetime, but the thing that you can do is pray for them. Ask God to uplift them, to enlighten them with peace, happiness, and with thanksgiving because it's really difficult. <clears throat> and this year, down here, we'll be divided on this dance, but all we can do is pray for those to come. We're not trying to say, look at me, look at me. We're trying to say that we see the need of these children with no guidance. We see the need of these young teenagers that are starting to do meth, that are starting to drink, that are starting to kill each other, that are starting to have babies and not know what to do with them. These mothers that might not have their man or their husband supporting them might be beating them, might be doing horrible things to them, making them have sex with other men. Wanting them to do horrible things, giving them brutal beatings, and maybe the and maybe the man, the husband, or the man himself, or the boyfriend, maybe he's getting beat down every day, and saying you ain't nothing, you ain't never gonna be nothing. Look at you. We need to, each other. We need men and women to uplift each other. We need the husbands, the boyfriends, the wives, the girlfriends to encourage one another. When you guys see somebody in need, help them. When you see somebody like they might be hot, if you ain't got nothing to give them, go get something for them to drink. Drive back around and walk up to them. Offer them some water or something to eat. They might not have ate nothing. They might not have no water to drink. But today, we're starting to forget about each other. Just as a lot of us have forgotten about God, and we have to bring that back. We have to start doing our best to encourage one another. I got to move. The sun's following me. We gotta, we gotta encourage one another. When I was young, I used to cut wood for elders that still had burning stoves. When I was young, I cut their grass. They used to always give me water. They used to ask me if I wanted money. I tell them no, and they said, "Well, you want something to eat?" Or a lot of these old ladies that makes me sad thinking about them. I could name them all. I used to cut the grass. They used to bake me cookies. They used to bake me pie because their sons were off working or their sons were in uh, the army or their sons were in prison or their sons might have been uh, uh, doing whatever they was going to do, but they weren't helping out their mothers or their fathers. But God gave me the blessing to be around them fluent speaking Ponkas. Not all of them were fluent, but some of them to be around them and to get, be able to help them and be able to do all I could for them. You know, today, you know, I told somebody, there's not very many that's left to speak for me in that way because they're all gone. Makes my heart sad. 
But we got to remember that. We have to remember that today we make a difference. Today you are that difference. Don't ever go. Because you're going to come into a lot of hardship throughout your life. And I'm telling you, it is really hard. It's really hard. But let me tell you something. It's all possible with Wakanda. It's all possible with help. And don't give up. I don't care how old you think you are, grandma, grandpa, aunt, a sister, young brother, young sister. You guys all have a place in our circle. We are that circle today. There you go. Don't give up. And don't ever think that you're dark like me or darker than me or lighter than me. Don't make you punker. You're punker. Don't you ever let yourself think to yourself that I'm not enough punker. I'm not good enough as a punker. Yes, you are. Everyone counts. That blood quantum don't mean a damn thing. That blood quantum was... That was paper genocide to our Native American people. And our punk tried to do So we about that blood quantum that they forget. Two hours. Oh. And we have to remember that. That we're punka. Try your hardest to learn the language. You know, down here, there was somebody talking bad on me because I'm teaching the language. They do that because, like I said, you got to remember something. You got to remember something. It don't matter if I'm dark on my father's side. On my father's side, Father Waterman, he's yanked in Dakota. And he's punka, but my dad is almost all punka like me. But it doesn't matter. Don't hear it. The clan system, it shows us that you follow your father's side. Grandpa Lewis was talking about that this, this Ponca tribe has can make a resolution to make it maternal, that we all follow our mother's side. We would If we did have done that a long time ago, it would have saved our clan ship today. It would have saved our clan system. But even though if we did that today, it would kill off some clan members because their dads are all Ponca, but their mothers might be another race or another tribe, and it would void them out. And so we have to pray for what we are and just be glad that we're Ponca. And and be glad that we're half breed clan. Be ha glad that you're Hisida. Be glad that you're Wajaji. Be glad that you're Wasabe. Be glad that you're Likida, Monkon, Nika Pashna, Nuke. Be glad. I don't want to mean to interrupt. Go ahead, Grandpa. But, uh, I'm I'm getting ready to go over there to the dance, juice water dance. I only okay. got one ride, and he's here, so I have to log off. But look, just everybody remember, love one another. I'll see you when we meet again. Uh, Monday. Yeah. Monday. Monday. Oh yeah, body parts. I'm I'm reading those now. We're What's gonna go the body parts. Yeah. Okay, well, she uh, ain't on bait, Tommy K. Oh, ho. Ega, Ega, Steve. Oh, ho. So that's what we got to do. I think I'm in the way of this woman. I've got one more little page about Sundance if you want to read it, Eagle. Go um, ahead, read it. We got really 60 minutes left. But, Come on. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. We're going to be done today. We're going to have it all weed and some of the brush uh, cut down, okay? I hope we're on the way. I made him cut over there so that you could park up there. Okay. That's my sister. That's my aunt's daughter. <laughs> Go ahead, sister. Okay. Um, this is um, Adam LeClaire. This gentleman um, told a story about the Sundance Center Post. It was taped by Sylvester Warrior, but I do not have the tape. Um, the the oh, well, we just lost the whole thing. Uh, yeah, I don't have the tape, so um, I think you have to go. I have to find it. I don't know. Like I don't have it personally. I have to locate who has it. Um, let's see, I just lost my whole contraption. My whole contraption. Okay. Yeah. Stay. Okay. Um, Adam Leclaire. 
Sundance Center Post, taped by Sylvester Warrior. The story I'm going to tell is a hand-me-down story. The story relates to the Sundance. This concerns a tree which had supernatural powers. A young man was out alone in a wooded area and came upon a tree that had four paths leading to it, north, south, east, and west. There were carcasses of animals all dead at the path, path of this tree, animals, birds, and even bugs. So he went back to his people and elders and reported his findings. The people had some members to go see this great tree. They figured that God made this tree possible and have had the Sundance since. No matter whether on a hunt or any time when the blue plant or foliage of a certain plant turns blue, the time is ripe to put on the Sundance. When the Poncas were first brought down from their Quapaw Reservation, they had dances at various places with no special name as the Allotment Act was not in force. During one of these dances, a group of older members of the tribe gathered at the present tribal grounds north of the present town of Bliss or Marland, Oklahoma. The old men selected two young men to go in search of a tree to be used in the Sundance ceremony. One of the boys or a scout was sent in search of a certain tree about 20 foot in height. He ran to the timber, dodging, falling, and stalking as if he was looking for an enemy. When he found the tree, he marked it with his hatchet or war club and returned to his elders to report that a suitable tree had been found. He comes back staggering and completely exhausted, falls down, and when he revives, the men praised him and said it is well done. Which way is the tree facing and which way is the tree facing and he said it's facing north. And we will attack it from the south side to catch him unaware. We must treat it as a human being because it has miraculous powers. Then the tree was cut down and taken back to the camp. And that's all there is to that little story. Adam LeClaire. <laughs> and that's the only other Sundance story I have right here. When they found that tree, Pardon? when they found that tree in the it was a food commitment. Found it. Come on, get the hell out of here. That would be barking crazy. I don't know what Res dogs. <laughs> Res, Res dog. Okay. These are the nice ones you go about. This right area right here is the, the Williams family. Anyway, there's probably about, I don't know, six, seven, eight settlements out here, six to eight settlements out here. And anyway, they all live out here. But some of them got dogs that will get you, for real get you. I'm glad they didn't come over here. I'm watching for them. That's why you keep seeing me look around and listening. But, yeah. And so, anyway, remember that. Uh it was a punkin man that found that tree, and that tree today, that sacred tree that our son that started after that, it was a punkin man that found that from the Moncon clan, and I forgot his name. I got it rolled down somewhere. Anyway, that tree was on fire, and that tree was on fire, and when he ran back at that time, we had a great assembly, they say, and that assembly, some say, was when we had that wah wah watch you, that pipe dance ceremony when it was the Ponca, the Omaha, the Oto, Cheyenne, Arikara, Pawnee, the Osage say they were there too. And it was a deal that we got together because of the great Sioux Nation. Get the heck out of here. And the damn dogs are jumping on my back. Go on. Go sit down. Go sit down. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I love dogs. And so back to that, and he went back, and we had that great council going on, and they had runners coming from all over because they seen that man running. You know, they had runners all over because whenever there were lookouts, they're called Wadombe or Wadomba. They're scouts, and they were looking for the enemy. They're always looking for the enemy. The second thing they're looking for is game, buffalo, or herds of elk or deer, whatever. But anyway. And so that tree was on fire. And so that tree was considered the enemy. And then when they raced back to what they call Kikinonga, they raced to it. There was a punk man that was the first one to touch it as well. 
And they say that he was from the Moncon clan, but all we know is these stories that were handed down to us. Some of them wrote down, some of them wrote differently. I don't know what's true, what's right. All we can know is fragments, or even if it's a whole story, it's from one side of it, one individual. And I ain't saying it's wrong or it's right, but we got to remember all that. And so, anyway. Yeah, I actually found another one. I just found another quick one. If Go you ahead. Hear it. Go ahead. It's really crazy how all this is um, organized and how how it's. Let me see here. Still getting there. Uh. Uh, the Ponca Sundance. This is the legend of the pla uh, of the Plains Indian Sundance ceremony, as told by Edward Packhorse Primo, translated by William Collins Sr., also a member of the Ponca tribe of Indians of Oklahoma. The stance to the sun was brought here by the Poncas from the land of the northern part of Nebraska, from which the Poncas were removed in 1877. The Sundance was prohibited by the U.S. government. Oh, did we read this? We may have already read this we in 1897. As a, yeah, I think we did. Hold on, there's another one then. You can't read it today because you didn't mention them guys. I ain't never heard you read any story by old man Pat Corris oh. and, and then by uh, okay. Colin. I just remembered that. Okay, maybe I read it to myself. Um, the Sundance was prohibited by the U.S. government in 1897 as it was too cruel. In the month of August, when the sun was at its highest and the moon was in its was in full, excuse me, the chiefs got together in council and talked about going into encampment for the annual sun dance. The appointed leaders, butchers, buffalo, police, and police. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I read this today. The appointed leaders, butchers, buffalo, police, and invited various or surrounding tribes to take part in this four-day affair. The standing buffalo family who had the Ponca peace pipe were asked to be the first to put up their teepees. Do you remember that, Eagle? You didn't I think read I read it. that already. You didn't read it. Okay. All right. We're asked to be the first to put up their teepees and select a place for the camp. After this was done, the whole tribe pitched their teepees in a circle around this pipe teepee. The men were asked to build a circular bush arena for the dancers. This was done voluntarily. After this was done, the different tribes of Osages, Koch, Oto, Pawnee, Cheyennes, and Sac and Fox were given a place outside of the Ponca Circle or camp, as they did not allow any tribe to camp in the Ponca Circle of its own camp. When everything was in order, the head men of the camp elected four or five men to go and look for a tall, stately willow and cut and trim the tree of its branches, leaving a little at the top. This tree was the sacred tree, and as was found by a young warrior on the scouting, the scouting mission. He told of finding a tree that was slight at night by some mysterious way, and that the Thunderbirds were using it for a roost. It seems that this tree had four paths leading to it, or the four winds, and the creatures that came to it left their skeletons and skulls at the base of the tree. So that is how the punk is prepared to attack it and kill it like a human being. Afterwards, it was brought by horses in a wagon without a box and hauled to the west side of the Sundance Lodge. The main body of Ponkas on horseback were with this group following with their gifts to be given away at the tree cutting ceremony. <clears throat> As the tree was hauled back to camp, the warriors on horseback put on a sham battle. As the warriors came towards the camp, they came as a tornado would, round and round until they took the camp. Every man had his horse camouflaged with great vines and leaves, handprints of red, white, or black, eagle feathers on their tails, and broadcloth around the horse's throat. <clears throat> Good saddle or blanket, and their shields had a high-powered rifle and a six-shooter for close fighting, and a scout knife, war bonnet for the chiefs, and all kinds of ornament for the warriors, like roaches, eagle, hawk, and crow feathers. After circling the camp by fours, they were singing their war songs and the women folks were cheering. The old men that did not go were talking and encouraging the young braves and older warriors that comp and complimenting them for the great thing that happened this day. After they circled the Sundance Lodge, the drummers were there and sang in the chief's songs and white horse riders dance. 
This dance is in honor of the chiefs. Anybody helping or taking part had to give a gift worthy of the chiefs or something of great value to them or to help someone whom they feel is in need. At this time, the young men made their horses dance just like a high horse today, high school horse today. The old man or the older warriors made their horses walk backwards and then forwards at the closing of the song. These horses that were ridden in the sham battle were all given away to friends or different tribes. After this, the participants of the Sundance went to their respective sacred lodges where their leader had a special prepared last meet for the four day ritual. During the night, <clears throat> their clothes were taken away from them by relatives and given a sheet and a breech cloth, red bead ornaments around their shoulder to their waist. The sheet was worn during the day like a dress from the waist down or a cover for the night. Articles furnished by the leader of the group was sage weed for the ankles, wrist and hair, <clears throat> eagle bone whistles with an eagle plume on the end, Painting of the participants according to their clan, painting of their faces was the most remarkable, as you could hardly recognize one from another dancer. After this readiness, you could sleep preparing for the run for the tree that was to be planted in the center of the Sundance Lodge. All right. It is 2.58, guys, or 3.58, or whatever. What is it, 1.58? Yeah, 1.58. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um... Do y'all do y'all want to finish? Oh, this is kind of long. I can just um, I can copy it and post it on the on the group if you guys want, just like as text. You okay, know what I'm if, you, if you copy and post it, make sure you also send it to Google okay. Classroom. Okay. We want we want all the that. that are be able to get that. Okay, so everything that we posted, if it's in yeah. PDF form or on Word, make sure you send it to Google Classroom. So that all our other punk okay, relatives I'll, get a piece of it. Gotcha. Yeah, I have to make up a new document, but I can do that. Yeah, I'll just okay. make a new document. At this time, I just want to say thank you for all the reading and the information. And uh, we're also gonna, even though we're gonna talk about body parts, we're gonna start taking pictures uh, of our class for the of our Sundance grounds, and we're gonna start doing a lot of work. There's gonna be a lot of stuff start happening over there. And I want you guys to be a part of it virtually if I can. Uh, and if I can't, you know, it, it just don't worry. We'll be there. We got this. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Thanks for everything you guys are doing. Yeah. Uh, Rob, can you go ahead and That's press awesome. up? Bro? I'm a mute. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so thankful. Uh, thank you, Connie, for being able to uh, read those stories, and thank you for those stories actually being written for us for a history. Uh, thank you, Eagle, for taking the time out to teach us, and for all of our uh, family members who were unable to attend. May they have a great weekend, and uh, thank you for all the things we're thankful for. I suppose. All right. Have a good weekend, everybody. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Robert. It was nice to see you guys today. It's good to see you, Connie. <laughs> you too. Hi. Oh, boy, Eagle flew out of here, didn't he? I think he's. Y'all have a good one. I'll see you. Bye. Yeah. All right. Bye bye, sweetheart.